Hello, everyone. It's a pleasure, really, to uh, give a talk today about service modifications of uh, biomedical uh, devices. And first, I'd like really to thank Professor Abdesalam Mahlouf that uh, uh, gave me this opportunity to present. Uh, on behalf of him, we are collaborating for about seven years uh, up to now together, and we we done really lots, lots of uh, fantastic output of, uh, of research. But he is very busy these days. He's moved uh, to another uh, uh, locations in USA that uh, he couldn't really provide the presentation. To so today I want to really talk about the self modifications and uh, uh, of biomaterials. Uh, self modification actually the biomaterials the first interactions comes uh, for biomaterial is first detecting the surface uh, of the implant or what is the medical device would be. And it's, so the immune systems, once it, detecting the surface properties would be keep the materials in the body or it's going to be rejected. So for surface modification, it plays a very important role uh, for success at the early stage, even of implantations. There are different uh, functions can be improved through the surface, uh, like surface charge, surface energy, uh, hydrophilicity. We can tune this as uh, a hydrophilicity uh, or hydrophobicity, depend on what type targeting of application or surface topography, changes from uh, nano to micro, and also the texture uh, characteristic. If we talk about nanotube, uh, plate structure, roads, and so on. Or we change the uh, sensing of the cells itself, like mechanical transaction as well. So outlines today, I want to talk about cell modification of magnesium as really the one of the very uh, uh, established materials up to now for, uh, for bone and distinct applications. Then I will talk about cell modification of polymeric scaffold, including nanofiber and 3D printed scaffold as well. Also, the last, as I, my background currently is a dental uh, implant materials, so I want to uh, discuss something very novel we have developed in, uh, in our group, and I will share with you. So magnesium has been started by uh, early of uh, mid of the last century, and uh, lots of research uh, are going on how can we push really for the magnesiums and its alloys uh, for stent and orthopedic applications. There are, but what is the reason of really uh, grabbing magnesium into action in biomedicals? Magnesium has excellent biocompatibility and mechanical properties are quite similar to the natural bone. That is the natural bone ranged from three to 30 GPA and magnesium has about 45 uh, GPA, which can really control or decrease the stress shielding effects that's uh, used to be having in uh, permanent implants such as titanium, stelsis, steel, and their alloys. So biodegradability, what is a really more uh, interesting characteristic, biodegradability and bioresorbability uh, of magnesiums. Magnesiums uh, show with uh, excellent osteogenic properties that the early bone formation and interaction with the surrounding bone and this paper being published in uh, Nature Medicine in early of 2016 and showed how magnesiums can uh, stimulate the gene factors responsible for osteogenic uh, properties. So the main issues that I will uh, share with you about uh, the high corrosion or rapid degradation rate of magnesiums. So magnesiums about the degradation uh, mechanism when it uh, just uh, interacted with the surrounding environment like physiologic environment in a human body, magnesiums in the cathodic reactions convert to magnesium hydroxide and relieve and magnesium hydroxide in excess amount of chloride like in our human body that is more than 150 millimole per liter converted to magnesium chloride. The main issue of magnesium is once released, once they are reacted and converted to magnesium hydroxide, release hydrogen, as we can see in hydrogen gas. Magnesium hydroxide is insoluble, but as I mentioned in chlorine, converts to magnesium chloride that is highly soluble compound and easy to extract it and remove it from a human body. 
So in a galvanic uh, electrochemical uh, galvanic corrosion, magnesium is, a, is a, the most active element and very active material. That's why it has uh, high or rapid uh, degradation rate. So what are the constraints of magnesium? However, we mentioned all of these uh, very appealing uh, properties of magnesium. Limitations of magnesium, the corrosion resistance. As we can say, the rapid uh, degradation rate that's uh, evolved with hydrogen gas. So hydrogen gas in the surrounding uh, environment can create like a bubble there. And theoretically, one gram of magnesium can generate one liter of hydrogen gas. This is uh, actually the main challenge. However, fast degradation rate can be acceptable in, in, uh, in different areas in the human uh, body, but still the main challenge is hydrogen gas. Early of 2010, this paper published in Nature Materials, they tried uh, to develop a new alloy of magnesium, zinc, calcium, glasses uh, to how really hydrogen gas evaluation can be reached to zero level. They done a good job, but however, this alloy is quite brittle and it couldn't be moved to clinical applications. Today, I wanna really share with you about simple ideas that's been uh, well recognized and highly knowledge in uh, different uh, applications and even start to move forward in Germany and in Korea. They provide a simple coating on magnesium to control its surface, uh, its corrosion, early corrosion, uh, high corrosion rate. So in general, the corrosion or degradation starts from the surface and it's measured by lens per, uh, per year, depend on how much penetration can happen on the surface. If we can control the degradation rate of the surface, we might able to depress the fast release of hydrogen gas from magnesium surface. So sol gel coating is a simple technique. This we say organic or polymeric coating, effective, very low cost, non-toxic, biodegradable and versatile. And also we can uh, make a drug loading within the, within the coating layer. Polyvinyl acetate, uh, acetate that's uh, first uh, I want to share, it has excellent uh, adhesive properties because the, the main limitation of organic uh, coatings is weak uh, uh, adhesion uh, properties uh, with a metallic substrate. In this, in this study, we uh, investigated three different solvents, base solvent of uh, BVAC, uh, tetrahydrofluoride, THF, and uh, diamethyl chloride, and also we done DMF. As we can see from electrochemical corrosion analysis here, uh, a high shift towards the, the positive sides it indicated the well controlled the degradation rate of uh, magnesium. And in, uh, for the diachloromethyl showed the highest uh, adhesion uh, strengths in both wet and in dry conditions. This is before removing the corrosion products for 30 days in a simulated body fluid to investigate this, uh, the coating stability. As we can see after even 30 days, the coating intact and uh, showed a good stability here. And what has been, can be seen here, this is a corrosion product during uh, the degradation of magnesium. After the removal of the corrosion products, we can see here highly See our severe localized corrosions occurred on magnesium surface compared to uh, coating substrates. Also, for, for uh, osteoplast uh, interaction with magnesium, magnesium, as I, I shared, is, it has excellent uh, biocompatibility. However, when cells come to direct interact with magnesium, kill the cell, as we can see here. And the main reason. Uh, due to the pH, high pH release and increase the pH of the surrounding or localized uh, zones on magnesium surface and also the abrupt release of uh, magnesium ions. Second, we uh, try to enhance the osteoconductive properties because the polymers uh, know very well it lacks the uh, osteoconductive properties as it's just uh, uh, inert uh, polymers. We incorporated hydroxabatite nanoparticles 
into uh, PCL polyepsilon caprolactone medical grade uh, polymer that is FDA approved polymer. And our hypothesis is that once hydroxybutyrate starts to release from the surface, enhance also conductive properties and formation of, uh, of bone. Not only that, once, magne once hydroxybutyrate release can create like a porous surface as well. And this helps to release hydrogen gas from the surface. Also show it's similar. That is a huge shift effect to, towards the positive side and in, uh, indicated uh, enhances the corrosion uh, uh, resistance or decreasing the corrosion rate. The mechanical properties uh, after uh, immersion for 20 days in a simulated body fluid, it's indicated the coating layer still show the body stability. And here is the formation of the calcium phosphate on the surface and mineralized uh, that has been shown in, in the published paper as well. We investigated XRD and DDS to uh, show what is the composition of uh, the uh, formed layer after immersion in simulated body fluid. Also, after removing the corrosion products, we can see a uniform, uh, a uniform corrosion on the surface compared to very harsh uh, or rapid degradation on the uh, neat cells. But something we, we, we noted really is very important that soil gel coating using deep coating or uh, spin coating, uh, the, the thin film of polymeric coating has three layers. We can see here, however, we provided a porous uh, structure, but this is superficial, intermediate layer and the prime layer that is, that is directly contact with, a, with magnesium substrate. Once hydrogen gas evaluated, create like bubbles and this process the layer from the surface. To avoid that, we developed the urgent spray technique that can do with it a layer by layer on the surface. And in that case, we have a fully porous uh, layer. In this fully porous layer, we can provide hydrogen gas release easily from the surface without uh, entrapping underneath and then create a, a first release of, uh, of hydrogen gas and filling the implant as well. In this study, air jet spray, it's a simple technique. And then when we really we sent to the journals, it gets rejected, uh, rejected after even receives the comments. However, now it gets more than 150 citations because it showed how really we could tune the degradation rate using air jet spray that is, has fully porous uh, layer. So I want to summarize this, uh, this, this part that's include a uh, uh, soil gel coating can tune and uh, uh, control the hydrogen gas evaluation from uh, magnesium surface. Also, the different solvent creates different surface topography and also uh, different cells uh, function on magnesium surface. Incorporating hydroxabatite into PLA or PCL, both of them are FDA board materials enhanced to to conductive and early pore formation of the on the medium surface. Natural bone, as all of us are aware about, it uh, has the, the, the structure, it critical bone of cancellous, uh, cancellous bone, and critical bone uh, contribute 80% uh, of uh, human natural bone. But really, human natural bone matrix are, are very complicated. As we can see here, in macrostructure level, and when we reach to sub-microstructure in a collagen uh, fibril, a, a very, very alignment of mineralized uh, abatite-like, or we say abatite-like hydroxabatite, calcium phosphate, on each single uh, fibril uh, structure. Here is just a schematic shows how the collagen fibril and abatite-like in a plate-like structure arranged on the surface that the inorganic materials uh, are responsible for uh, providing uh, a high load uh, bearing uh, uh, properties for, ma for natural pores. Trials on incorporating inorganic uh, materials onto the single, uh, each single electrospan fiber, but as we can see, there's lots of agglomeration on the surface that, that can create a plus uh, release of uh, hydroxabatite from the surface and also weakness 
of the scaffold regarding its mechanical properties. Another way of how we can enhance the biomineralization of the scaffold by, by immersing uh, the scaffold in simulated body fluid at different time points can start from 10 days up to uh, 28 days, depending on what type of polymer, the concentration of the simulated body fluid. And here we can see the surface uh, was fully encapsulated by mineralized uh, layer. However, we should consider that it's a time consuming and this uh, during immersion in simulated body fluid can change the, the scaffold properties like uh, accelerating the degradation before implantation and also uh, poor mechanical properties. Our strategy is very simple. We try to mimic the structure of the extrasolar matrix of natural bone. Here is uh, electrospine fibers and immerse it in a colloidal solution of hydroxamatite. Then we applied autoclave at 100, from 130 to 180 degrees Celsius to try to fully cover the surface of each single electrospine uh, nanofiber by hydroxamatite. This uh, SEM image shows uh, the, 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 the topography of electrospan fiber looks like yeah, similar to extrasolar matrix and TMM imaging uh, indicates the surface uh, smoothness and doesn't have any uh, rough properties. But after hydrothermal treatment and uh, coating the scaffold with hydroxabatite, you can see in one, in start from 30 minutes up to one hour or uh, up to three hours that we done a proper study on that. You can see the surface, each single electrospan fiber after hydrothermal treatment being covered, fully covered with a nanoplate-like structure that we can see here after we dissolve it, the electro, uh, electrospan mat and we collected the, the mineralized uh, layer from the surface. We can see hydroxabatite nanoplates being formed in a very uh, regular fashion in each single electrospan fiber. XRD also confirms the deposition and formation of uh, hydroxabatite onto the surface. TGO also indicates the, uh, how much uh, concentrations start from 10.5%, 10, 10 we reached, we could reach 26% contribution of inorganics, uh, hydroxabatite minerals on the surface of electrospan max. Enhances also the mechanical properties as we can see increase the elastic, elastic modus properties and ultimate tensile strength. However, it decreases the elongation, but still the scaffold handy and uh, can be uh, handled very easily and also enhances the surface suitability, as we can see. Cell culture has a uh, host plus properties because a uh, matter of time, we, we done uh, ex gene expressions, we done also conductive properties as well, ALB activities and showed uh, Definitely, there is hydroxabatite on the surface, enhances the biomineralization. Using the same techniques, because most of the study tried to use uh, bioactive glass ceramics but the, as a soil gel, but once bioactive glass ceramic capsulated within the scaffold or within the, the, the polymeric scaffold, it's isolated from the surrounding environment and it can lose its function like uh, accelerating the early bone formation. Using this technique, we use as received bioactive glass ceramics particles and using the, the electrospan scaffold, that's different substrate actually, as I will share in a, in a minute, and using the same hydrothermal technique, dissociated the particles uh, in, the, in the solution and during the hydrothermal reaction, the particles assembling on the surface of uh, polyamide six substrates. Here we can see this is AB shows the casted uh, fill and C and D as you can see here after the uh, precipitation of bioactive glass ceramics to the surface. We also tested this high versus using uh, 3D printer and electrospan fiber. Then we characterize the, the surface to prove the precipitation and uh, formation of bioactive glass on the surface. We also done visibility, viability, cells viability, osteoblaster cells on the surface and showed how bioactive glass on the surface accelerate 
the, the early bone formation and as well after the precipitation of bioactive glass run up on the surface, we tested the mineralization functions uh, uh, for, I believe for five and yeah, for five and 10 days. As we can see, hydrox, uh, bioactive glass once uh, start to release calcium phosphate, accelerates the early bone formation that we can see here, accelerates the calcium phosphate compared to neat uh, electrospun uh, scaffold. Not only that, we use this technique, poly PLA, polylactic acid, FDA approval materials, widely used as stent in stent application drug or implantations. But the main limitations of, uh, of PLA, it has hydrophobic properties and low mechanical properties because it's brittle materials. But using this one, we use polyvinyl uh, alcohol. It's FDA approved material as well. A solution and we immerse in the electrospun scaffold in that and we heat it uh, up to from 120 to 140 degrees Celsius. As we can see, the electrospun surface, fiber surface, fully capsulated by polyvinyl alcohol and it changes the surface uh, hydrophobicity to be hydrophilic, to hydrophilic materials uh, and enhances the mechanical properties uh, significantly. So hydrothermal treatment is a robust technique, very easy, simple, and cost-effective. We could enhance the surface characteristics of, uh, of uh, 3D uh, uh, printed or to spun, and even we tested the biofilm of the formation of inorganic uh, nano uh, material on the surface. As well, we could tune the uh, mechanical properties and the wittability of uh, PLA scaffold. Just, uh, however, this is very simple technique, but we managed to publish in, in well, uh, noisy journals. This really, I need really your expertise, and I wanna share with you, this is some novel studies uh, we developed recently in our group, micro holes on titanium dental abutment using film to second laser micro machining, using subtracting modification process, because most of, if we making additive manufacturing on titanium apartment, once implanted and using the screws, easy to detach it. But in that, in that case, we use subtraction. We try to create holes or tubeless on the surface of titanium apartment. Let's say I give just a, a quick background. What is the current challenge on this time? So here once uh, 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 failures due to uh, biofilm formations or so we, we, we move to, we have to have implanted for, uh, uh, for, for the defects that's uh, been removed some decisions there. So here we, the implants, once the implant, uh, implant success for the point issue, there is no issue about 97% success rate of uh, uh, bone tissue integration with the, with the surrounding uh, of the implant with the surrounding uh, tissue. But the issue here in the abutment section, once it starts uh, the uh, black hue or biofilm formations causes the, the failure of the implants. So here, if we can see the collagen fiber, collagen fibril attachment is perpendicular to the natural teeth. But then when we have implants, it becomes like a superficial and the attachment is very weak. So we need to seal this area because if it's not sealed, there's lots of black you and biofilm formations happens and causes inflammation, then failure of the implants. What we, we really suggest, if we can develop like a, a holes or a tubes on the apartment section, this one in this section. And in that case, we will force the soft tissue insertion to be particular as well. And in that case, we can avoid the penetration of black use or biofilm formation of bacteria grows in this area. Here micro, we, we use fifth to second laser micro machining, as uh, we can see here, the, the using additive uh, CAD CAM uh, technology. We created, a, uh, the, we designed the, the, the structures that we are looking for. Here is we working on two different pore size, seven and 14 micrometer. You can imagine each single hole here, it's about seven 
I have the 15 micrometer using femtosecond laser micromachining. And it can be seen here from the uh, SCM surface morphology. All the surface looks like similar in a very fashion uh, uh, organization and uh, fabrication of superficial uh, uh, micro microtubules or titanium apartment. Then we tested that using uh, uh, fibroblast cells, as we can see here, the surface, you, you probably you can see that the holes here, the tubeless, the surface fully covered. And we, I will share with you in a, in a minute how the cells in, in penetrated and infiltrated within these holes. Here in the CM, share with the surface fully covered and we try to, to find out areas that's not fully covered from cells to see inside how is the, the cells matrix uh, goes through the, these uh, tiny holes. You can see here, multi layers of cells being formed uh, through this one. So what we expect, in, if we do implantation in, uh, for that one, so that the cells infiltration or the soft tissue infiltration can help can seal the apartment from uh, failure. We done a cross section, however, it was very challenge to take cross section of seven micron, and we done a resin inbid to to show the cells infiltration within the section one. Currently, what we are uh, facing actually, and I need your feedback, professor, about it. Are we done in vivo? And uh, now the challenge is that how we can uh, investigate and how we can quantify the infiltration of the soft tissue through these holes. However, we we, we done a try before, as I shared in the same image, using in vitro uh, study, but it's still a challenge to take many, many sections just to, to see uh, the cells. Not only that, we still uh, doubt this is, can be a matrix or it can be a resin embed as well within these tiny holes. Uh, I want to acknowledge uh, University of Queensland for supporting our research as well and a couple of research funding from HABS, our uh, health uh, faculty at UQ and the uh, School of Dentistry and uh, Research Center of course. Ray. I want to thank all of people working together, uh, my students, uh, visitors, uh, and undergraduate and research assistant. Uh, thank you very much and uh, happy to receive any questions from you both. Thank you. Thank you too for your presentation. That must be exciting for the biomedical community. Now your talk is opened for discussions, maybe comments. We have a couple of minutes. Does anybody have questions or? I don't see any in the chat. Okay, if no questions, then let's move to the second talk. Thank you again. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, it is a pleasure to participate. I don't know, sir, thank you, this conference. Uh, and uh, sir, the fourth time. And um, my talk is about uh, for electricity and the nanoscale. <clears throat> in principle, I cannot move the slide. Okay, okay. Uh, in principle, uh, this is a talk about nanoelectronics uh, and uh, uh, how new materials are influencing the development of nanoelectronics. Uh, in principle, like, as you can see from the screen, uh, uh, the materials have boosted the uh, other ingredient. Uh, they have boosted the more load, the dimension that we see today. You have to know that the beginning in an integrated circuit were of five or six elements from an Mendeleev type table. Today we have uh, 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 half of the table in a uh, complex integrated circuit, very, very large scale. Many many materials are there. So. Uh, the materials are boosting uh, the, the, the research in uh, nanoelectronics and other materials. 
whole thing. Uh, also, communication of doing the same thing because we need the very fast communication. We need very fast uh, uh, data tracks. <laughs> Uh, we need uh, uh, a lot of uh, uh, tunability of the devices to perform these tasks. A big surprise was the hamnium uh, uh, oxide, which is a typical dielectric used in integrated circuits today, uh, in my laptop, in my telephone, etc. Are uh, uh, is ferroelectric. It's ferroelectric by doping, creating the stress. The stress modifies the atomic. Uh, 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 structure of the uh, 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 oxide, it becomes non, non central symmetric and in a certain configuration, a certain for certain doping of uh, uh, a lot of dopants like silicon, zirconium, uh, lantanium, etc. It becomes ferroelectric. The ferroelectricity uh, is important in hamnium oxide because it's a single ferroelectric which is integrated with CMOS technology. I said it was a dielectric in, in the actual CMOS technology. And you know that ferroelectricity has a property. So uh, 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 like uh, 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 magnetism, ferroelectricity means a hysteretic behavior between the electric polarization and electric field. This means that uh, you have a memory effect and any device uh, uh, which contains ferroelectric is a non-volatile uh, electronic device. Here is, you can see the polarization as a function of electric field measured uh, for uh, six nanometer hafnium or oxide doped with aluminum, doped with zirconium. Uh, and uh, uh, we have evidence it also that it, it is a ferroelectric. Uh, uh, working in microwave, you know that ferroelectrics in microwaves are uh, 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 are producing a dependence of electrical uh, uh, electrical uh, permittivity on voltage. The single materials which which perform this in microwave dependence on electrical uh, on uh, electrical permittivity on voltage. This means that you produce not phase shifters. And this is the phase shifter that we have made using hafnium oxide at the wafer level, hundreds of these devices were at point with a very good uh, uh, phase shifting uh, in about two millimeter uh, uh, long of such a wave that coplanar, uh, coplanar wave that uh, you are able to uh, rotate 180 degrees uh, the phase of an electromagnetic field in the range between one and 12 gigahertz. We have made also a, a, an antenna array consisting of two uh, 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 electrons, of two antennas, uh, each of them phase shifted in its own way. And we are able to rotate with 25, even 30 degrees the, the uh, uh, character the radiation characteristic with plus one volt. The huge advantage of uh, hafnium oxide is the following: it it is ferroelectric basically up till ten nanometers. This means that you work with field, very low fields, one plus plus one plus two up to four volt only. And uh, classical ferroelectric which are perovskites, you need hundreds of volts to to produce of uh, a phase shift. Here you need one volt to volts, which coming from basically from a battery. Uh, this is the corrective Fedger, but uh, a journal, which is a famous journal, electronics letters. We have made filters, all of type of filters with uh, this color electrics have been set. Uh, low pass, band pass, uh, uh, high pass, uh, with good performance. Uh, then we have combined for electricity coming from hamnium oxide with 2D materials. We have made some uh, atomistic calculation and we have seen that hamnium oxide ferroelectric doped, so hamnium oxide doped with zirconium yeah, uh, is, 
is opening a Ben Gap in graphene monolayer, which is very important because graphene monolayers have no Ben Gap. Uh, and here is the first circuit, it's a transistor, where we have uh, 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 made for the first time a graphene transistor over aluminum oxide ferroelectric. Uh, here are the fabrication process. It consists of, uh, is a typical process. It's patterning with electronic beam. It then serves and drain metallic gates are produced. Then the dielectric, which in, case, in our case is having, is, a, is an organic, is hashes pure, is made, which is about 30, 40 nanometers. And then we put, uh, we put uh, finally, we put the metal electrodes. And you can see that the transistor is uh, 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 compared to a, a graphene transistor, which is not open, which is not closed. <coughs> it's just a resistance dependence on uh, a drain voltage. You can see here that the transistor has two clear states. It saturates, it tends to saturate. Uh, we didn't apply too much voltage because uh, it's burning. At two volt, uh, the current is one milliamp, which is very high, uh, uh, high very high current. It has two distinct on-off states, uh, and uh, it is a ballistic transport at room temperature because the roughness of the uh, oxide uh, is very small, so graphene can be uh, is transferred without uh, making defects on on, on so it is. Uh, the roughness about 0 0.1, 0 0.1 nanometer is very low, the roughness. High on of ratio. And of course, the distance between the uh, search is very small. It's, I think, it's 200 nanometer. Uh, the carrier mobility is high. It's 9,000, it's very high. And, uh, uh, and um, in this way, we have shown that the existence of the two states on and off, uh, uh, assure that uh, the, we have induced a band gap in graphene of about, we calculated 0 0.4 electron volts, almost like in six. Okay. Uh, the next uh, uh, device that we have performed, as I have told you, that uh, have you uh, oxide ferroelectrics and any ferroelectrics introduced in a transistor produce uh, a memory effect. In this case, we will term it as mem transistor. The mem comes from the memory, uh, also from the mem resistors, which is uh, resistance with memory. Yeah. Uh, and this time we have used uh, uh, amniocyte done uh, dot with uh, uh, germanium nanoparticles. They have a diameter of 0 0.2 nanometers, is shown in here in the, in the temp. Uh, creating a structure, uh, and uh, we have shown by PFM, by uh, capacitance measurement, that this structure is ferroelectric. Okay. Uh, and here is the, the transistor, the main transistor you can see. You will see that uh, the drain voltage uh, uh, drain uh, dependence on the uh, um, drain current drain voltage it is con conducting an on-off state and all the states will have memory. Okay. And of course, uh, you, can see, you can see here the, the, the drain uh, voltage dependent on the gate voltage with a very big hysteresis. And this big hysteresis uh, uh, show the non-volatility uh, uh, of the memory effect that we have. The behavior in time is also very interesting because as soon as you increase the, the current, this is here in time, you increase the current at a positive voltage, the current is increasing and this is saturated, and then the opposite, if you have a voltage, negative voltage applied, the current in time is, is, decreasing, is decreasing until it's saturated. And this is show that, uh, uh, in fact, conductance is increasing and decreasing in time, uh, which is a property uh, of a synapse 
in fact, on artificial synapse, any mem transistor or mem resistor is an artificial synapse. And uh, 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 we see this is stripped many times, and we see this. And, uh, and um, this is the main transistor that we have uh, produced. It's also produced at the wafer, wafer scale uh, due to the oxide for uh, We have also performed multiple uh, gate transistors. So having two gates, top gates and the bottom gate. Uh, uh, you have, you see a nearby an array. This is used to, uh, to make, uh, to produce logic functions. Uh, logic functions which are uh, uh, reconfigurable depending on the search drain voltages. So basically, depending on the uh, values of the gate one and gate two, what you see here, uh, and consider zero lever, the, the current passing through the device in the absence of any gate. Uh, up and below, you will generate an OR function. Uh, if you change this level to another level, uh, the zero level, we can generate other types of logic functions. Okay. In microarrays, we have uh, uh, succeeded to try to, to implement the first integrated circuit based on uh, having zirconium oxide and to, to, to make a radio yeah. and to, uh, to make a radio. Uh, uh, basically this time, this is also a transistor, but this transistor have the drain answers in the shape of a both bow, bow antenna. Below it's graphene and below it's having oxide that dot with the zirconium. And uh, it is a, a very versatile detector. Uh, here is the setup we have right here. It's a very versatile detector. And you can see again here the memory effect that uh, we collected in the uh, drain current uh, 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 gate voltage dependence at various uh, 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 sweeping of the uh, gate voltage when the drain current is about 0 0.1 volts. And is a det detector with a memory. And you can see here the detect it is a radio signal. A uh, radio signal at a frequency about which I'm speaking to you as in is between one and 10 kilohertz, the, the detection. And the carrier of the micro it is uh, somewhere between four and 10, and, and 10 gigahertz. So we have succeeded to produce a very small radio. It's a, a detector uh, uh, which automatically memorizes the detection values until you will come with another voltage and it to, to refresh it. And together with you and the man, uh, which is the chair of this conference, we have developed another ferroelectric, which has nothing to do with uh, carbon oxide ferroelectric. It's a uh, stannium uh, uh, sulfate, tin sulfate, sorry, tin sulfate. Uh, which is a ferroelectric even in its, in its 2D state. So a monolayer of tin sulfate is a ferroelectric. And uh, we have, uh, uh, we have uh, uh, succeeded to uh, uh, make some uh, planar lines to measure its properties because compared to carbon oxide where the polarity is uh, where the polarization vector is vertical uh, uh, on the substrate or out of plane, which is typically for the all majority of electrons. Here, the polarity is in plane. So the uh, uh, electron polarization vector is in plane. And uh, all the theory of the ferroelectric is built for uh, uh, measurements, is built for vertical polarization. And for horizontal polarization, you have no uh, uh, standard way to measure such a ferroelectric. Therefore, we have 
with this uh, uh, interdigital capacitor. We have integrated it with a coplanar line, and the first results uh, were obtained. Uh, uh, the first results were obtained, and uh, uh, we have seen a phase shift of about uh, 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 see, uh, uh, 40 degrees at one gigahertz, and uh, it's continued up to 10 gigahertz, showing that indeed the 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 substrate the uh, in uh, sulfide ground by uh, uh, our colleagues from uh, you know, is very lucky. Uh, 10 nanometers, six, uh, grown by uh, RF pattern. So you can see that uh, uh, the recent discovery of, of uh, electricity uh, and, um, uh, and um, nanoscale. Uh, Oxide has boosted a lot of applications. So, basically, I can tell you that ferroelectricity uh, 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 was uh, almost an uh, unstudied uh, phenomena in the area of electronics because many people have tried, uh, and when they have seen that you need 50 volt to uh, get a phase shift or 50 volt to memorize the data. They abandon it because today you can do this with other means at uh, five volts or three volts. But the appearance of uh, um, avioxide based ferroelectric have boosted a lot of researches uh, uh, to use the ferroelectric, uh, ferroelectricity uh, in nano devices and nanoscale, nano electronics. And this is a, a pretty good uh, account for the state of the art today. We have developed very all of this in the last three years. <coughs> After we have learned from material people that having oxide uh, could be ferroelectric. Uh, it's difficult to be grown. It is grown by atomic layer deposition, which is a complicated instrument. Nobody, many people don't have such a such an equipment, we have this in mind too. And in this way, we have succeeded to uh, learning from others to do and uh, to perform uh, ferroelectricity uh, uh, in a thin film, which is uh, six nanometers thick and even four nanometers thick. It's not easy. It, uh, the film is not, uh, is uh, polycrystalline, uh, almost amorphous, and uh, many times create problems. Uh, there are technologies to revival the ferroelectricity by uh, okay, warming the material, uh, uh, doing a lot of technological process to heal it. But to my surprise, I have uh, measured some of these devices after one year to see if the ferro ferro ferroelectricity is still there. And it was still there. Yeah. And uh, uh, but the main problem of the ferroelectricity is this, is uh, uh, to use it in the memory, because any transistor with a dielectric uh, 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 ferroelectric is a perfect memory. You don't need the other thing. But the problem is here, that in the, uh, uh, during the time, the ferroelectricity is lost due to the depolarization phenomena in the lattice. Since the, the ferroelectricity is, in fact, a strain atomic structure. This strain atomic structure in, in time uh, is, uh, is relaxing. Yeah. Uh, when you use ferroelectricity like here for uh, 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 detection and so on, you, you don't bother too much about memory effect. But for the memory effect, this depolarization is a big problem. and. Uh, uh, it is intensively studied by many groups, uh, materials group. I'm, I'm not working in materials, I'm working in electronics. And I collect data from them, I discuss with them and so on. You can see here how my colleagues, they, they all participated in this uh, uh, work uh, that I presented you. They are quarters of many papers that we have written. And I uh, thank you for your attention. And I thank uh, to my colleagues for their work, uh, intensive work in this few three years since we have developed uh, uh, ferroelectric devices at a nanoscale. 
and it's a very nice thing because this year there are 100 years uh, celebration when the when the first ferroelectric was discovered is a uh, Rochelle sun and it is celebrated it's one, 100 years after many years after this uh, when this area of research was uh, uh, ne neglected now you see a new boost uh, after 100 years therefore that name of my uh, of my talk the rise of ferroelectric and atmosphere thank you for your attention Okay, thank you for your interesting presentation. We have something like seven minutes left, and that's enough for giving you questions or comments or discuss, start discussions. Are there any in the audience? Uh, maybe I, yeah. Somebody is going first. Rainer, yeah, please. Yeah, thank you for the nice talk. Um, so I think, yeah, these mem resistors, mem transistors are uh, probably revolutionizing the electronics in future, especially uh, pattern recognition circuits and so on. Um, please forgive me, I'm coming from material science and not electrical engineering. So maybe I, uh, maybe you mentioned it and I was overlooking it. Um, yeah, you showed there is the um, parallelism uh, of the mem resistor or mem transistor to the synapses. So if we are kind of completing this, uh, then neurons would be uh, the oscillators which are driving that. What is yes. your opinion about how to uh, kind of deal with the whole uh, kind of logic inside that? Would you say that um, it will be an oscillator uh, kind of... Uh, um, controlled uh, electronics, which uh, contains then these uh, mem uh, switches? Yeah. So, a lot of people are trying to, uh, to work now in the so-called neuromorphic computer. Uh, I am uh, rather skeptic about this. So, uh, there are <coughs> really processors <coughs> which have billion of transistors, billion, the, this is the, the number, billion of transistors for you know, neuromorphics uh, application containing million of synapses. But uh, uh, this billion of transistor integration are not able to uh, uh, mimic uh, the performance of a of a brain which works basically with a chemical reaction. And the idea for pattern recognition and so on is, is, is true, yeah. Uh, there are algorithms uh, using this uh, digital, which follows. Uh, I have read just a paper uh, where uh, the, our authors claim that can emulate the entire visual system uh, with synapses artificial synapses, but I'm very skeptic uh, that they can do it, they yeah, are just basic experiments. So many people's hopes this, but in uh, reality, uh, uh, if you take into account that in a human brain, you have 10 at the power 20 synapses and 10 at the power 12, 13 neurons, this is well beyond the power of the integration uh, of electronics. So what can we do is to make some uh, algorithms, some uh, nice papers, uh, have some recognition pattern letters, numbers and so on, but uh, will not go very easily far. Um, uh, not next year, uh, an entire brain will be uh, uh, limited by uh, an integrated circuit. It is rather difficult. If you work, for example, with a microprocessor, uh, a Lofi, uh, uh, it is fabricated by Intel, is a neuromorphic processor. It is rather difficult to program it first. Uh, 
to, to use the software to program such a microprocessor. You cannot uh, program uh, uh, to work like uh, it. It works at pattern recognition very well at many in many applications pattern recognition, but uh, 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 it is not an easy task. So the first. Uh, uh, problem regarding neuromorphics is uh, we cannot is the integration and scaling down we cannot do it with, with actual technologies yeah. uh, probably will be a big step forward when we go to atomic technologies because there are today transistors one atom transistor that's reported there are uh, uh, atomic state on the surface of the materials which are used for switching and transistors. So this is the scale you need to emulate uh, even the brain, I don't know, of a, a very primitive uh, uh, animal. And uh, uh, the second thing, uh, mem memory store, yes, is uh, 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 an analog, an electronic analog of a synapse, but it's not the thing. There are a lot of approaches, electronic approaches, uh, uh, to uh, give this function, to increase the uh, conductance in time or to decrease in conductance in time, to produce spiking and so on. But think about if you have two neurons, between only between two neurons are 10 at the power four synapses. Uh, you cannot go very, very uh, much further with the uh, uh, actual state of integration devices. You can do, one, uh, let's say, 200, 500 pairs of this, and you stop. So uh, it is very good that the people are searching such devices. It's very good that there are neuromorphic, uh, neuromorphic uh, uh, algorithms able for uh, to detect number letters vision, uh, basic photos, but we stop here. I think the low energy consumption is another goal. Ah, this, uh, is, uh, mm. this, is, this is another problem. Mm. Yeah. This is another problem. Uh, uh, it is a well-known experiment that a lot of computers are used to perform the task of a brain, and they use the power of a, uh, of an electrical plant to do this. Yeah. While the brain is using the power of a, or, of a, 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 a small lamp, yeah. something 15 watts. Yeah. Therefore, all the nutrients that we are eating, in 90%, they are going in the brain yeah. to, to feed the brain, to give him energy. So, yes. The energy is another big gap, yeah. But the main gap is you cannot make, you cannot mimic the complicated architecture that has the brain. As we know the brain today, 90% of the brain is not known how it is working. Um, I'd like to start off by thanking um, everybody, uh, particularly the organisers, for this opportunity to present this work. Like many of the participants uh, yesterday, I'm very sad that I'm not able to deliver this talk in person. Having uh, visited just now for um, a summer school a couple of years ago, I was really looking forward to coming back. And I do hope in the future, when things calm down, that will be possible, as I had a wonderful time with wonderful hospitality last time I visited. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today is some work that really has been a collaboration with a colleague of mine at the University of Glasgow for the last five years. And it's going to be a little different to the two other talks um, uh, this morning because we're really going to be looking at soft materials and um, particularly gel-based materials that actually have quite a lot of implications in biomedical engineering, but they're very often used um, from kind of commercial products, but we're not necessarily clear on what their structure is. And as we'll find out, their structure actually really affects their behavior quite significantly. So that's what I want to focus on today is how can we understand the structure of gels and maybe use that information to design better materials that have um, higher value applications, particularly in biomedicine. 
So I'm going to start with some thank yous because uh, I don't want to forget to thank these people. This has really been um, a, a very long collaboration with Professor Dave Adams at the University of Glasgow. He's one of the world's leading um, uh, gel chemists and has a huge library of materials that can be studied for a huge range of different applications. And it's really been through collaborating with him that we've got to the bottom of how some of these materials behave. And that's been supported very much by uh, Emily Draper at Glasgow, Bart Dietrich, who actually um, uh, synthesised all the materials you're going to see today. Uh, students Demetra and Libby, uh, Dr Claire Wilson, who did some of the crystallography I'll show you later, and my own just graduated PhD student, Dr Chris Brasnett, and we've had a lot of time at various synchrotrons um, in Europe. So uh, Diamond, the B21 and I-22 beamlines, and also the uh, for the neutron scattering work, I'll show you uh, SANS-2D at ISIS, and also um, I-12 at the um, ILL in Grenoble. And all of this money uh, came from one of our UK funding councils, which is engineering and physical sciences. So with that out of the way, I'm going to start by just giving you a kind of overview of, of a gel so you can get an idea of the kind of materials I'm talking about. And we can define a gel as a dilute cross-linked system, which is mostly liquid, but behaves like a solid. So really, the materials I'm talking about today are 98, 99% liquid. Um, and um, what we have is effectively something that... Um, is going to form a fibrous network in three dimensions, and that's going to trap this liquid uh, inside the network. So gels are interesting in this respect because effectively we're trying to structurally understand something that's almost entirely solvent. We have this tiny fraction of this fibrous network, which is going to give it the solid-like properties that we're interested in. And when we think about gels, most people think about them as being polymeric materials. And this is absolutely true. You can easily make gels from a number of polymers. And in fact, you encounter gels that are made from polymers every day. So if you've ever eaten jelly, you've eaten gelatin. This is a natural polymer. If you wear contact lenses, you're wearing a synthetic polymer gel in your eye. And so these things are ubiquitous um, in terms of where we find them in applications. But they're a lot more diverse than you might first expect. So yes, we can make them from polymers, but also we can make them from anything that forms a network. So for example, colloidal systems where colloidal particles can join together, they can form a gel. Um, they can form from proteins, either individual proteins or polymerized proteins. And they can form from small molecules as well. So any small molecule that can assemble into a fibrous structure is possibly capable of going on and forming a gel. And that's what I wanna focus on today. So they're interesting from a fundamental structural perspective, but actually understanding their behavior is really critical in a number of industries. So we find um, gel-based products in a lot of food industries, but we find them in um, personal care products and also in pharmaceutical products as well. And understanding how they behave over time, for example, what kind of uh, mechanical properties they have is really, really important. But since I've been working with Professor Adams, we've discovered that there's much more to them than just being these kind of passive soft materials. If you can tune the functionality of the molecules that, that are self-assembling to give this network, what you can actually do is tune them to do chemistry or tune them to have behaviours uh, of their own. So you can potentially put catalytic sites in. So you can actually do catalysis in a gel network. Or, for example, you can make soft electronics out of them. And so there's a huge amount of different things we can do as long as we understand the network structure. And particularly relevant for, for maybe some people in this audience, in bioengineering, if you want to make, for example, a three-dimensional scaffold to grow um, stem cells and differentiate stem cells in, we know that the hierarchical properties, things like the mechanical properties and the structural properties of the scaffold have a huge impact on the type of differentiation process that may occur. And so if we understand this, we can potentially custom design much better gel-based materials. So I'm going to stick to one particular class of materials, and that's something we call the dipeptide low molecular weight gelators. And the reason for sticking with these is that they actually give us a huge amount of parameter space to explore. So I'm showing you a picture here, a chemical structure of a very classic uh, low molecular weight gelator based on a dipeptide. And this molecule we refer to as 2NAPFF. And 2NAPFF has a naphthalene group here, this is the NAP part, and two phenylalanines on the end here, so this is our FF part. And what's nice about 2NAPFF is if we drop this molecule into a solution at high pH, so say pH 11, it will automatically self-assemble to give these kind of flexible fiber-like structures, but they're in solution. So we've not formed a gel, we've just made a solution of fibers. And we can look at these fibers and we can try and understand them. And that's one of the things I'm going to present. 
Now, what's nice about this system is when we form these flexible fibers in solution, we can lower the pH or we can throw in quite a lot of salt. And this will bring the fibers together in the network. So we've got a tiny number of fibers. We're going to bring them together in a network and that's what's going to form our gel. Now, if we look at the structure of TUNAP FF, those of you who have any interest in sort of synthetic chemistry and making new molecules will notice that there's an awful lot you can do with this molecule. You could change the amino acids. You could functionalize the naphthalene group. And we'll talk about how we might do that later on and what some of the pros and cons of doing this are. But for now, I want to tell you two stories, one based around TUNAP FF and one based around a modified version which use scattering in order to probe very, very um, carefully the nanoscale structure of these gels as they form, because that's what we're going to be interested in. Now, it would be uh, um, remiss of me to say that there aren't a lot of problems of working with low molecular weight gelators. And um, one of the things that we very often turn to to understand the mechanical properties of these materials is rheology. So this is going to give us the bulk mechanical properties. It's going to tell us how strong our gel is, how stiff our gel is. And for biomedical engineering purposes, for scaffolds, that's going to be really crucial. We want to know how strong is this gel going to be. But it tells us nothing about the structure. And when we think of the normal methods that we employ to look at structure of materials on the nanoscale, there's an awful lot of issues if you're working with a gel. So the first thing we might think of is either SEM or TEM. Well, our sample is 99% uh, solution. So if we have to dry the sample, what we're looking at in a dried sample is not necessarily representative of the gel in its natural state. Removing the liquid massively changes the structure. And so we can't be sure that we have the same structure at the end of the experiment that we do uh, at the start. So electron microscopy is not great. You can do cryo EM, and I'm going to show you some cryo EM on some of these systems later. Um, but there's a second problem, and that is the way we do a TEM measurement, we're looking from the top down. And if we look from the top down onto these nanoscale fibers, all we're seeing is effectively a two-dimensional projection of a three-dimensional material. So it tells us nothing about the cross-section. And actually, we'll find out later that cross-section is really important in terms of structure. So we're seeing, you know, a, a cylinder and a tape look the same on a TEM. Uh, a sphere and a disc look the same on a TEM. We need a three-dimensional representation of this network structure. Now, we can move to AFM, which is better because we can do it in solution. And there's been quite a lot of liquid-based AFM done on these. But again, it doesn't get around this idea of seeing beyond the surface. So that's why I'm going to stick to small angle X-ray and neutron scattering today. This is going to give us a much fuller picture in three dimensions. And most importantly, it's going to let us probe dynamics. So we're actually going to be able to follow processes as they occur. We're not just looking at an equilibrium structure. We're looking at changes in the structure with time. We do have some issues, however, with length of fibers, um, polydispersity and contrast, but we won't worry about those for now. So when we use neutron scattering, one of the really cool things about doing scattering with neutrons as opposed to X-rays is something called the scattering length density of the atoms that we have in our structure. Neutrons scatter from the, uh, from the nucleus of our, of our atoms in our sample. And what we find is that if we replace hydrogen with deuterium in our materials and then run the sample in a deuterated solvent, in our case, D2O, we can effectively do something called contrast matching. And what contrast matching does is it makes part of our sample invisible. This allows us to probe on a molecular level individual parts of a molecule and how it self-assembles. And that's what I'm going to talk about in this first story I want to tell you. So here's TUNAP FF. And here you can see TUNAP FF with different parts of the molecule highlighted in red. Where I've put highlights in red, I've deuterated this part of the molecule. So when I run the self-assembled structure of these molecules in solution in D2O using neutron scattering, these parts in red will become invisible. They'll still be present in the structure, but the neutrons will be unable to see them. What this will then do is allow me to really look in detail at what parts of the TUNAP FF molecule are self-assembling and interacting with other parts by effectively looking at what's missing from the scattering pattern. And I'm gonna ask some questions when I do this experiment. And this is really kind of a fundamental set of questions that we have in the gel field. If I start with a high pH self-assembled solution of two NAP FF cylinders, which I know I get, what is the solution state structure of these cylinders? What do I start off with? How can I use this contrast matching to understand the molecular self-assembly of these cylinders? I'm then gonna throw in this molecule here, which is called gluconodeltalactone. What this does is it hydrolyzes really slowly and it re releases protons into solution. 
By doing this, it drops the pH of the system really slowly and it does it homogeneously. So we get a really, really nice homogeneous gel. So the second question I want to ask is, how does this process occur? Okay, what's happening during the gelation process? And then the final question I want to ask when I've reached the gel state at the end is, what is the gel state structure of these cylinders? Is it the same cylinder that I started with? Or has there been a structural transformation in my self-assembled cylinder during gelation? And our neutron scattering and our X-ray scattering is going to help us probe this particular process. So I'm gonna start off with the high pH solution structure. Now, one of the first things we always do when we're going to be deuterating anything is we want to make sure that the deuteration process itself doesn't affect the self-assembly behavior. Uh, the hydrogen deuterium bond is slightly longer than a hydrogen bond. And if your self-assembly is driven by hydrogen bonding, you wanna make sure that that change in bond length doesn't give rise to a different structure. So we run everything in D2O in X-ray scattering, which is completely agnostic to deuteration. And what we found was that all of our X-ray scattering structures were the same. So this tells us that our deuteration has no impact on our self-assembly process, which is very reassuring. So here's the kind of data we get out of a small angle X-ray experiment. Um, and so these are very, very characteristic scattering patterns of something that is a flexible cylinder in solution. And if we fit these to a form factor, what we can pull out is the fact that the radius of these cylinders is around about 4.2 nanometers in each case. We were very fortunate to work with um, Johns Hopkins University with Hong Kong Kui's group who did some wonderful cryo EM with us. And he was able to pull out the fact that indeed in the cryo EM in solution, you're getting these flexible cylinders and they're about four nanometers um, in radius, which is exactly what we saw in the scattering, which is fantastic. We also um, turned to molecular dynamics simulations. So we worked with CWEP Marinx Group in Groningen, which is where my PhD student now works. And we um, asked if he could simulate what would happen if we took two NAPFF in an MD simulation and let it self-assemble. And what they found was, yes, indeed, you will get a flexible cylinder, but they were able to actually probe the fact that this red ring in the MD simulation here is actually the naphthalene groups. And what they're doing is they're overlapping. So you're getting effectively a, a bilayer structure of naphthalenes. And then on the interior and the exterior of the cylinder, what you're getting is um, the amino acids. So these phenylalanine groups are pointing in and they're pointing out. So we have this kind of sandwich structure. That's going to be really important when we look at this selective deuteration in the neutron scattering. So what does that look like? So these are all the um, small angle neutron scattering patterns. You can see they're pretty similar to the X-ray scattering patterns, but they do have some subtle differences. So the first one here is just a neutron scattering pattern of 2NAPFF. And again, this comes out now, we can see it's a hollow cylinder. We get better resolution in terms of the hollow interior of the cylinder in sands than we do with sacs. And so we can see, and the, the, the radii come out to be pretty much the same. There's always a slight difference between neutron radii and X-ray radii, but they're all within error. So this is our, our, our standard 2NAPFF. Here's our naphthalenes in the middle. Here's our interior and exterior amino acids. So these are the ones on the end that are poking in and out of the tube. And then these ones here, this amino acid group here, this is the pale blue here. So the first thing we're gonna do is deuterate naphthalene. If we deuterate naphthalene, we're effectively making this red ring invisible. Now, we wouldn't really expect to see any change in our neutron scattering pattern in terms of the radius and the wall thickness. So we're going to be interested in what happens to this core radius and what happens to this wall thickness as we deuterate parts of the sample. We get rid of naphthalene, we're getting rid of something in the middle here. We might see a kind of multi-layer structure, we might see nothing. So this is our scattering of, um, of, of our um, deuterated naphthalenes. If we move to the next sample, however, you can see we've deuterated this, this uh, terminal phenylalanine here. And so what we're doing here is we're getting rid of this dark blue ring on the inside and the dark blue ring on the outside. So we should expect to see an increase in core radius and a decrease in wall thickness. If we deuterate this amino acid here, we're getting rid of the light blue rings in our structure. So again, like the naphthalene, we may or may not see anything. And then finally, the most kind of extreme version is to deuterate both of the amino acids. And so here we're getting rid of the light blue and the dark blue, and all of our scattering is simply coming from that red naphthalene ring. So we should see a huge difference in wall thickness and in core radius if our model is correct. 
So what do we see? Well, that's exactly actually what we do see. We can see that for 2-NAP-FF on its own, 2-NAP-FF with the deuterated naphthalene, and 2-NAP-FF with the interior amino acid deuterated, you can see that the core radius and wall thickness are all pretty much the same. So that's telling us that the deuteration is not really affecting what we see in the scattering pattern. However, if we deuterate the exterior amino acid, so this terminal amino acid here, or both amino acids, you can see immediately that the wall thickness drops, the wall thickness drops quite significantly here, and the core radius goes up commensurately uh, to take into account that we've lost those rings. And so this was telling us that our model actually is correct. And this is the first time anyone had really probed what the three-dimensional solution structure was of these materials. So the next trick is to add GDL and to watch the sample go into a gel phase. So we looked at the small angle neutron scattering data for the gel phase. And the first thing that happened was it didn't fit a flexible cylinder model, which was somewhat of a surprise to us. So all of these neutron scattering patterns look pretty similar. And these are all the different deuterated versions. And the first thing we realized was we've no longer got a, a standard flexible hollow cylinder in solution. And we were a little bit perturbed by this. So we had to go off and do quite a lot of looking at the literature and quite a lot of um, thinking about what could be happening in the sample. But we also realized that we'd um, quite cannily taken some time resolved data as well. So we'd taken during the gelation process a series of time steps as, as the gelation was occurring. So taken a scattering pattern at various time points. And by probing into the structure of these and looking at the structural changes in the scattering pattern, we were able to actually identify what our end state was and how we got there. And so the first thing we noticed was pre-gelation in our hollow cylinder, you get this nice bump in the data. And this bump in a scattering pattern um, of something that's in a cylinder state generally tells you you have a hollow core. Well, we know that we have a hollow core. We've been able to fit that data. And the first thing we notice with our time resolved data is the first thing that happens over a series of tens of minutes is the hollow core disappears. So something's happening to make the hollow core go in the sample. The next thing we did was we looked at the transition in this kind of mid-Q region here. And we noticed that the shape of this mid-Q region, um, that what we call the fractal region, changed. So we were getting a very subtle shift in the gradient. And what this is telling us is that our lovely isotropic cylinder, which is now solid, is now becoming anisotropic, it's becoming elliptical. And when we went back and fitted the data, we found that we could fit it incredibly well to a flexible elliptical cylinder model. Now, what that made us realize was, and because we'd taken pH data all the way through this and we looked at what was happening, is that the amino acids on the interior of the cylinder and on the exterior of the cylinder have different pKa's, basically because they're in different environments. So the pH drop affects the amino acids differently. So what we found was that the interior amino acids protonate first during gelation. And so they protonate first, the charge is removed. So the tube effectively, there's no repulsion inside the tube anymore. It just closes up. The second thing that happens is the exterior amino acids now become protonated and we lose the charge on the outside. And this allows lateral aggregation of the fibres to come together. And if you start to laterally aggregate fibres, they're going to start to effectively look more anisotropic and you're going to end up with something that's got the same thickness as you started with, but it's going to have a much wider um, major axis of the ellipse. So it's going to become uh, much more eccentric as an ellipse as you go on. And that's exactly what you see when you fit the data. So for the first time, we've been able to show that this gelation process for these low molecular weight gelators is actually a two-step process. And it was only by using scattering that we were able to do this. But this threw up another question of, we know 2-NAP-FF is very well behaved as a low molecular weight gelator. We know exactly what it does. We can control it very well. But what we don't know is if we design any given low molecular weight gelator, will it gel? So there is no way at the moment of predicting whether a, a, um, a low molecular weight gelator will form a gel and more importantly, what the properties of that gel might be uh, so that we can design something specific for a particular application. So what we wanted to know, is there any way that we can use structural information to do some predictions? Um, and we work a lot with computational chemists, but we, we wondered if there was an experimental probe for this. So there's an assumption in the literature, if you go through the literature, you'd think that this actually wasn't a particularly um, difficult question to answer, because everybody says if you have a low molecular weight gelatin molecule, if you crystallize it, then the structure you get in the crystal structure will tell you about the packing in the gel. Now, that didn't sound a particularly satisfying 
answer to me that why would the crystal structure of something tell you about a soft condensed phase? I don't, I don't see why they would be related. But this seems to be a truism in the literature. So we thought, well, let's investigate it and let's see whether or not this is actually the case. So in order to do this, we had to turn to a slightly different low molecular weight gelator called 2 nap aa which I'll show you on the next slide. And the reason we picked 2 nap aa is we have a crystal structure of it, but also we can tune the gelation of 2 nap aa so it either goes through a gel state and stops, or it goes through a gel state and forms a crystal state. So what we can do is we can follow the evolution of the gel state with small angle scattering, and we can follow the evolution of the crystal state with wide angle scattering. So wide angle scattering is simply looking at um, molecular level organization, rather akin to powder X-ray diffraction, but instead now we're doing it in solution rather than in, in, a, powder in, in a powder pattern. So let's have a look at 2 nap -AA. And what we find with 2 nap -AA is we've got the same naphthalene group, but now we've got two alanines instead of two phenyl alanines. Just taking a slight different amino acid completely changes the way this self-assembles. So you can see here, 2 nap -AA can form a nice gel. It can form gel plus crystal, or it can form crystals on its own. And so again, we set ourselves some questions that we wanted to answer. If we start with a high pH uh, solution of cylinders of 2 nap -AA, if we lower the pH very slowly with a small amount of hydro, um, GDL, we know we form a gel. If we lower the pH quickly by throwing in quite a lot of GDL, we know we form a crystal. So what happens to the two NAPAA cylinders during this process at slow and fast um, pH drop? When do we see evidence of crystallization? At what point does this occur? And how does this compare, if at all, with either the powder X-ray diffraction or the crystal structure that we get out? So can we use those to predict the structure of the gel? So the first thing we did was a very slow, uh, was a very slow pH drop. And if you do this, you only get gelation occurred. We were able to fit this to a flexible cylinder model, which reaches a steady state of about four nanometers um, in, in radius over about a 200 minute period. But the interesting thing is we can also pick out the flexibility of the cylinder from the scattering data. So this is X-ray scattering data. And built into our model is a measure of the Kuhn length, so basically the flexibility of the system. And what we found was that the flexibility of the system drops massively as time goes on. So our fibers might be the same diameter, but they're getting progressively stiffer over time. Um, so what we were showing here is that as the pH is dropping, these fibers are locking up and becoming very stiff. However, if you look at the wide angle scattering, there are no peaks. There's no evidence of order in the fibers and there's no evidence of crystallization. Now we compare that with the fast pH drop. So immediately when we started to fit the fast pH drop, um, we could only fit this to a cylinder. We lost the flexibility completely, even at early time points. So you can see that this increase in persistence length, this stiffening of the fibers is really, really critical. So we started to, to we lost the, the flexibility immediately. We were able to fit this to um, a, a kind of roughly four nanometer cylinder, but after 180 minutes, our scattering disappeared completely. So our small angle scattering um, was, was effectively non-existent um, by the end of the experiment. And this is telling us that our fiber network that we've created has now disappeared. So we've lost the underlying gel phase structure because we can't see it in the uh, sacs anymore. So what happens in the wax if we're doing this in the sac? So we've said that we've stiffened the fibers and we've got a, uh, a loss of the gel state structure. Prior to 170 minutes, so prior to um, the gel state structure disappearing, you see nothing in the wax. So there's no evidence of ordering. The fibers might be stiffening, but they're not ordered. However, at the exact time point that we lose the sax pattern, you see the first peak in the wax. And this is in this red line here. You can see a tiny little peak just under 20 degrees. And so we've now got evidence of something crystalline appearing in our wide angle pattern. And if you analyze this peak, you find its real space value is 4.6 angstroms. And we know from previous work that 4.6 angstroms is the distance between two NAPAA molecules along the fiber backbone. So what we're seeing here is evidence of growth of a crystal along the fiber backbone. And if you carry on running the wax patterns over time, you find that more and more peaks start to grow. And when you compare this with the powder X-ray diffraction pattern that we simulated from our crystal structure, every peak you see in the wax, despite the fact that this is technically in solution now, 
Every peak in the wax matches a reflection in the PXRD, and um, it's all the strongest reflections. And you always get, no matter how many times you do this, the growth along the 111 plane. And so we're actually seeing growth along the fibre. So to put all of that together, what does it tell us? It actually tells us, ironically, that the crystal phase and the gel phase are not the same. If the crystal phase and the gel phase were the same, we would expect to see evidence of packing in the wax pattern even before the crystal structure started to appear. We only see evidence of, of um, crystalline behaviour once we've destroyed the gel network. And yes, the crystals that we get out are the same as the single crystals of the gelator, but what they're not is related actually to the gel phase. So we can do this low concentration, high concentration comparison, and we can start to talk about this process in terms of flexibility. So what we do know is that the stiffening of the fibres is really important in terms of crystallisation, and it always happens preferentially along the direction of the fibre. But what it doesn't tell us is that we can use the crystal structure to predict what the gel looked like, because actually when you look at the sacs of the gel, it bears no resemblance to the crystal structure that we get. So yes, the crystals are the same, but the gel structure is actually something completely different. And by monitoring flexibility, we're able to pick up a little bit more about how to understand this. So whilst it would have been nice to have a predictive tool, what it has done is, is laid to rest maybe this idea that crystal structure is the be all and end all. And actually what you do need to do is use solution-based techniques such as X-ray and neutron scattering to better understand the structures of your gels. So where do we go from here? Well, uh, having these, this, this library of low molecular weight gelators is really exciting for me because there are subtle differences between how they assemble. And we found that things like we can change the kinetics of the process simply by changing the geometry of the, the, the sample holder that we do it in. And um, we can change the, um, the kinetics and the endpoints of the experiment by changing confinement. So these things are massively susceptible to being confined. So we're exploring this in terms of related materials, and we're looking at building up lots and lots of different ways that we can affect these different uh, solution to gel and solution to gel to crystal transitions. We've shown that you can't predict gels from crystals. We need computational methods to do this. And we're looking at uh, focusing on having one gelator and lots and lots of um, different endpoints to our experiments. What we don't want to do is design lots of different molecules. What we do want to do is design one molecule that will do lots and lots of different things. And then potentially what we'd like to do is, is really work with biomedical engineers, material scientists and say, how can we design better materials and understand them so that you can use them in applications? And with that, I'm going to finish. Thank you for your time. Uh, I also thank the organizers for that opportunity to present our results here. And with the next slide, I would love to give my special thanks to my old friend, in a good sense, old friend, Professor Ion Tignano. With him. Oh, sorry? Who are these two young guys? Yeah, that's the point. So we have studied together with Ion Tignano long ago together in the Moscow Physical Engineering Institute. We spent few years in the students' dormitory, not only studying physics, but also playing football in the rain in front of the dormitory. Finally, in 1978, got our diploma that were given to us by academician Nobel Prize winner, Professor Academician Basov, Nikolai Basov. So that's a very short uh, historical excursion. And uh, thanks God that now we are still in business together with my old friend, Ivan Tignano. Thank you for this invitation to this conference and for the possibility to give this plenary talk. Here is the layout. <clears throat> First, I will spend a couple of slides only about the instrumentation that allows performing uh, terahertz spec uh, spectroscopic experiments. I will finish with a short conclusion, and in between, I will give just flash very briefly without any details, so just uh, representative results about what we got on several, on a number of uh, materials. This will be graphene, as you see here, carbon nanotubes, and the fully rensed nano water with its ferroelectricity, magnetic nanoclusters, 
aerogel materials and uh, water, nano-confined nano water in biological systems. I would like to apologize in advance since I will be speaking about um, so strongly different materials in my presentation, but I have several excuses for that. The first one is that um, I will show you that terahertz uh, spectroscopy is not only effective, but also a universal tool that allows to study very different materials. Secondly, I believe that in the audience, there are representatives from the community, from magnetic community, ferroelectric community, CNT community, and other community, water community, bio communities. And hopefully they will find some parts of my presentation that will be interesting to them. And finally, <clears throat> when one uh, studies uh, with certain technique, very different materials, one has a possibility to somehow uh, get impression about uh, general behavior in those different materials. I mean, the behavior, the generalities in physical properties, and maybe one has also an, a possibility to draw some general conclusions about the properties of those materials, maybe general, maybe even philosophical, that can allow to draw some really um, very general uh, uh, impressions about the physical properties of condensed matter. So these are my excuses. I will speak about these several materials here. The results are obtained in collaboration with many groups from all over the world. They are listed here from Russia, of course, Finland, as you see here from Germany, Japan, UK, uh, and of course from Moldova, with whom we also did some joint investigations. So just a couple of slides about the equipment that allows to perform uh, spectroscopy in the terahertz range, which is specified in this uh, frequency interval, approximately from uh, 0.1 terahertz up to approximately 10 terahertz. So this is a terahertz range. And there are three main spectrometers that are used for the experiments in this range. These are listed here, the coherent source, so-called frequency domain spectrometer, the pulsed time domain spectrometer and the traditional Fourier transform spectrometers. Just a few slides about that. So this is about the coherence of spectrometer spectroscopy. It is based on these unique sources of radiation, terahertz radiation that can give, uh, they basically generate the radiation that is monochromatic, coherent and its frequency can be finely tuned just by changing the supplying high voltage. So these sources of radiation, these are backward wave oscillators. They cover the frequency range from approximately 0 0.03 terahertz up to 1.5 or even two terahertz. They allow for direct measurements of any basically characteristic of any material as shown here, just a couple of examples. Uh, for the dielectric material, material one can apply uh, one can measure uh, the spectra of real and imaginary permittivity. So a couple of examples are shown here. So these are the absorption lines and corresponding dispersion in epsilon prime, real part of permittivity or this ferroelectric material. Also, we, one can measure the magnetic resonances as shown here for the magnet manganese 12 magnetic cluster. I will speak about it a little, a little bit later. So these are the real uh, and imaginary, imaginary parts of magnetic permeability. You can see that these are the resonances. I will speak about them a little bit later. So these are the possibilities of the coherent source backward wave oscillator spectroscopy. Another nice technique is the past time domain spectrometer that is based on the fact that the picosecond pulse interacts with a sample and then is detected by a semiconductor antenna and the information about the properties of the sample is obtained by Fourier transformation, Fourier analysis of the pulse that passed in transmission mode through the sample. And of course, the traditional spectroscopy, Fourier transform spectroscopy, that is basically an infrared technique, but with its low frequency uh, wing, low frequency uh, part, it covers also the terahertz range. It is based on the Michelson interferometer. Everybody knows about how it works. 
And finally, one can measure with this technique the reflection coefficient of the samples or the transmission coefficient of the, of the samples. So we are doing this spectroscopy in our lab at Moscow Physi uh, Physical, oh, sorry, Institute of Physics and Technology. These are very briefly our spectrometers, the coherence source spectrometer, two uh, time domain spectrometers, Fourier transform spectrometer, and in addition, we are also using the radio frequency spectrom spectrometer, which is shown here. It allows for measurements of the properties of the samples in the range of frequencies from subhertz up to several megahertz. So with all this equipment, we can measure a very uh, broad spectral response of basically any kind of material. So I start my review with the nanocarbon materials that can be zero dimensional or like uh, fully range or one dimensional like CNTs, carbon nanotubes, two dimensional graphene, or they, are, they can be also three dimensional nanostructures. There is no need to say that these guys, these materials find lots of applications that range from electronics to biology and medicine. And they also reveal rich fundamental interesting properties that are very actually studied. So graphene, everybody knows what this is. Uh, normally it is uh, grown on uh, copper foils. And here I show the standard uh, procedure how the graphene can be transferred from the uh, copper foil to any other substrate. And that's important for terahertz measurements since copper is not transparent for terahertz radiation. <clears throat> but at the same time, all the measurements are done in transmission mode as shown here in terahertz range. Here, the graphene was transferred to the silicon uh, transparent substrate. Here, one measures the transmission coefficient versus frequency due to interference of radiation within the substrate. One gets this interference fringes in the transmission coefficient. Although these uh, spectra look very trivial, but their analysis, they allow to get very important fundamental information about the charge carriers in graphene like the conductance versus frequency and temperature or the scattering rate of charge carriers in graphene, as shown here. If one rolls graphene, one gets carbon nanotubes. A nice introduction was given yesterday by Professor Mimura about carbon nanotubes and also about the <clears throat> very exciting applications, not of single carbon nanotubes, but, uh, carbon nanotubes, but of as they call them wafer scale films of carbon nanotubes that is shown here. These are actually uh, several centimeters large films with a thickness of about or even less than 100 nanometers as shown here. This is a photo of our actual sample. We simply gl glue these films on the metal ring and this film is seen, seen here is yeah, one centimeter large, but the thickness is really 80 or 100 nanometers only. And then we measure in transmission mode <clears throat> the dielectric, pro the terahertz properties of those films. Yeah, this is a Kelvin probe image of this film. It contains, of course, lots of these bundles of CNTs, separate CNTs. These are the first results. <clears throat> first, what we found is that in terahertz range, uh, the Electrodynamics of these microscale films is determined, is metal like actually. The conductivity is Drude like. Drude means uh, it can be described by Drude conductivity model, which is a textbook uh, example of metal metallic properties. And the same with the dielectric permittivity. So both are Drude like in the films uh, whose quality is uh, very good. If the quality of films get worse, then one sees the decrease of conductivity, increase of permittivity, and one gets the so-called terahertz conductivity peak, which has been under intensive discussions for many years. Another issue is that, uh, what I would like to stress here is that by doing this very simple uh, experiments, just by measuring what, uh, by, by letting terahertz radiation on the sample and then measuring what comes through, one can obtain a very fundamental information about the charge carriers in those films, as shown here. 
So here we show the temperature dependence in the broad temperature range from liquid helium up to the room temperatures, room temperature of the plasma frequency of charge carriers, their scattering rate, their mobility, mean free path, and scattering time. Again, in such a simple geometry of experiments for the measurements. One can obtain, of course, as shown here, some technical characteristics like the absorption coefficient to affect its skin, skin depth, surface resistant reactions, and real measuring parts of refractive index, or the shielding effectiveness, as shown here. So these films can be used as effective uh, shields for the radiation of up to one terahertz. It's not always bad to uh, worsen the quality of those films by, for example, making the carbon nanotubes shorter within the film or by ir irradiating with a plasma, in this case, oxygen plasma, those films. So both these uh, procedures, they lead to the decrease of conductivity, of course, here and here. But at the same time, one has a possibility to enhance an important characteristic of those films, that is the temperature coefficient of resistance. This is shown here. By shortening the length of CNTs within the film, one observes, observes huge increase of the, uh, this coefficient. And also the same happens if one exposes these films to the plasma. One again observes this uh, strong increase of this uh, uh, important technical parameter of those films. Next, fullerenes. These are zero-dimensional uh, carbon structures, nanostructures that are interesting by themselves. But also they are extremely exciting because they can be used as containers due to so-called molecular surgery. Using some procedures, one can open fullerene, separate fullerene, put in some molecule inside, like water molecule in this case, then close it again. And finally, one has this encapsulated molecule, like water molecule or another ion within fullerene, and one can study single particle or collective effects in the array of those and the fullerenes. First, I will show you some fresh results about what happens if we, in terahertz range, if we put inside the lithium ion. Since lithium is very small, it can travel within the fullerene, and then facing uh, hexagon or pentagons of the of the uh, carbon nano cage, it can it can experience these local minima, and then depending on the temperature, the lithium ion can either fly above those minima or at low temperatures it, it can be localized within minima, hope between the minima or even tunnel between those minima. So what we have obtained with our spectroscopy is shown here. So this is actually the imaginary part of permittivity. This is the absorption coefficient versus uh, frequency. The reference range is here. One can see that there are very, very many absorption lines. And as usual, of course, the most important and interesting of what is happening, it's, it happens at terahertz range. This is shown here also. We have observed the so-called soft mode, absorption mode. So the red color is for the room temperature peak, absorption peak, and then while cooling down, it moves down in frequency, and also its uh, intensity decreases while cooling. Another interesting uh, effect we have seen, it is shown here, <clears throat> when we replace six lithium for seven lithium ion, then we observe uh, nice isotopic shifts on some of those absorption lines. Yeah, all these results are under analysis, and they are very fresh, just obtained something like yesterday. Next, uh, endofullerene is a uh, uh, water molecule within C60 fullerene. Here we had several possibilities what to study, interesting effects. One uh, phenomenon is the so-called uh, spin conversion of uh, water molecules. It's known that water molecule uh, can have protons that are aligned in parallel. This is the ortho modification of uh, molecule or para molecule when the proton spins are oppositely aligned. The mechanism of this conversion is not uh, known in, in all details. And we decided to also to shed some light what was possible without the spectroscopy. 
The idea is shown here. These are the energy levels, rotational energy levels of water molecule and para, para water molecule. <clears throat> so what one what one can do, one can yeah, and of course, as I said, as usual, these uh, energies are in the Terrakos range. What one can do, one can cool down and then trace the intensity of these water transitions and para transitions. That's what we have done. This is shown here. <clears throat> So we trace the intensity of this transition of paramolecules and of this transition of photomolecules. The results are shown here. So while cooling down from below 70 Kelvin down to liquid helium temperatures, the intensity of this transition increases permanently, while the intensity of this transition of photomolecules first increases due to Boltzmann thermalization, and then due to uh, orto para conversion, it decreases strongly. Another way how to study this uh, transformation is to quickly cool down the sample down to some temperature and get inversion of population of orto molecules and then wait and watch uh, with the time the intensities of these orto transitions and para transitions. That's what we have also done. So here we cooled down to six Kelvins and then waited for 10 hours. This is the time axis. And as you see here nicely, the intensity of these two orta transitions falls down with time, while the intensity of the para transition increases permanently. What we can learn from here, it's also under analysis. Uh, obviously, this behavior in time and with temperature is obvious, <clears throat> but uh, the point is that the functional dependencies uh, can bring some microscopic information about the uh, orto para conversion process. And that's under analysis, as I said. Then we come to the three dimensional structures. Uh, this we have with the dielectric matrices, where the crystal lattices, lattice has <clears throat> nano cages where one can have water molecules. I have spoken about these effects, what we have obtained on these structures uh, during last conference. Uh, we had a possibility to touch the mystery of so-called water ferroelectricity. It's really very exciting phenomena. In liquid water, one is not able to observe. The, yeah, the point is that water molecule is strongly polar. And so that the, uh, if you place these water molecules one close to another, one could expect uh, ordering or water ferroelectricity, but it's not absorbed in liquid water due to H bonds. Uh, and that's why one, one has to take the water molecules far apart and then uh, try to absorb the water ferroelectricity. That's what we have obtained. As I said, we, I, I have discussed these details during the previous conference. And we have observed the ferroelectric Curie-wise behavior of the permittivity and the ferroelectric soft mode. But we didn't see in beryl, in the crystal of beryl, the real phase transition. We didn't see this uh, ferroelectric anomaly due to the suppression of phase transition to, to, due to quantum tunneling or the dipole moment of what molecules. But we did observe the ferroelectric transition in another crystal of cordurite where the, where the localizing potential is strongly asymmetric. So here we have observed the soft mode behavior in the uh, sorry, radio frequency range and the typical V-shaped dependence, temperature dependence of the uh, frequency of this soft mode. And the order, uh, the ground state order is shown here. So we have observed, we have analyzed the data and we have seen that there is a ferroelectric alignment of uh, water dipole moments within the AV planes and antiferroelectric alignment along the C axis, perpendicular axis. More details about the ground state of those materials will be given tomorrow by our co worker Belenchikov in his presentation. Next, I want to briefly to switch briefly to the uh, molecular nanoclusters, magnetic nanoclusters. These are materials that have macromolecules with the magnetic ions. In this case, these are iron eight, eight iron ions with spins up and spins down, so that the total spin equals 10. And what we studied here, <clears throat> we did study the transition of the ground state S10 multiplet split by the crystal field. So these are the transitions. 
they are seen very nicely in the transmission coefficient spectra. These are the G minima. And when one cools down, then some of this uh, transition uh, absorption disappears. Some of those get stronger, as shown here. And all this is due to the Boltzmann factor that determines the population of these energy levels. One uh, also has a possibility to study <coughs> relaxation, magnetic relaxation phenomena. This we did on another magnetic cluster material, mang manganese 12. That's the macromolecule that has 12 manganese ions, again, spins up, spins down, total spin 10. What we did here is that we first, at high temperature, we polarized the material with a magnetic external magnetic field. We populated this energy level, then we quickly, yeah, then we cooled down, quickly reversed the magnetic field. We have inversion population of spins that are at this, on this energy level, then we fix the temperature and wait. And of course, they want to relax to the lower energy level so that the absorption due to this transi transition should decrease with time and the absorption due to this transition should increase with time. That's what we did observe. This is shown here. That's we just started waiting. This is the absorption line in the transmission coefficient spectrum. And then after waiting, this line disappears and the other line grows up here. So this is the relaxation, which we also did analyze and publish the results in these papers. It's not only to play around with this transmission coefficient and these absorption lines, but this simple and at the first glance tri trivial spectra, they allow to get very fundamental information about the magnetic material, like the coefficients uh, in the magnetic Hamiltonian as shown here. Next are these aerogel materials. We did some experiments together with two professors, Ion Tigignano and uh, Rainer Adalung. They gave very nice introduction about these materials yesterday in their lectures about the amazing properties. Just imagine enormous porosity, 99.99. These materials are built of these uh, tetrapods, the guys that have four legs, and each leg has a wall of thickness of just 50 to 100 nanometers, so thin. And this, that's the reason they are this, of this uh, extremely high porosity of these materials. Okay, I see. Mm -hmm. Five minutes. So this is a regular uh, result of our measurements. We measure the spectrum of dielectric permittivity and any other uh, parameter, electrodynamic parameter. What we found first on the gallium nit nitride aero, aero material is that in the very broad temperature interval from helium up to room temperature, the uh, spectra are not depending, are not changing with the temperature. That's really amazing. So having this spectra, one can calculate the shielding effectiveness of those materials. It's rather high at terahertz frequencies. And since it is not depending on the temperature, for example, it can be used for some aerospace uh, applications where it's, it's really cold. Another aero material is gallium-203, as different to the gallium nitrate, which, ha which has very low transmission coefficient. This material, this oxide is very transparent, so the transmission coefficient is nearly 100%, and this allows to use this as uh, uh, cover, protecting cover that is transparent for terahertz and also uh, infrared radiation in some applications. Yeah, I'm close to finish. <clears throat> About the uh, nano water in biological systems, you can really find this nano confined water in membranes, in channels in those membranes, in hydration shells, in other uh, bi biosystems. Some results will be given today by our student Gakaeva, Zarina Gakaeva, and also uh, tomorrow by another student, Pavel Abramov. I just want to briefly show that uh, our very first experience with applying the terahertz spectroscopy to the uh, uh, biological materials. So we have studied these three substances and immediately we found in these materials four universal behaviors that are very well known in the condensed matter physical community. The first is one is the so-called universal dielectric response, which is given by this universal expression, so-called Jonsher expression. The second one is the so-called, again, nearly constant losses, 
over many orders of magnitude in frequency, the losses which are epsilon double prime, their frequency independence, nearly constant. The third is the scaling behavior of some combination of the ACDC conductivity versus some combination of frequency temperature and conductivity when they all fall in a single, single master curve. And the fourth universality is the so-called boson peak in the density of states, which we also have observed in these uh, three biological materials. With that, I can conclude. I hope I really demonstrated to you that terahertz spectroscopy can help very much to study new physical phenomena in the nanophysical uh, materials, nano nanomaterials, and also help to uh, find some applications for those materials. We are doing that at our laboratory, the laboratory of terahertz spectroscopy. We are always open for collaborations as shown here with this couple of photos. We have rich collaborations and that's the contact information which you can also find in the materials of the conference. I hope I, I was in time. Thank you for your listening and for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Gorshunov, for your excellent presentation of such a broad spectrum of phenomena and applications that I hope that in the remaining two minutes, there will be a few questions. So please, who wants to uh, uh, formulate a question? Yes, please, Professor Magyarevich. Thank you very much for your very nice presentation. Uh, my, my question would uh, con would be uh, uh, directed into the time to market from all these interesting uh, research results that you have mentioned now. Namely, uh, in the biomedical instrumentation world, uh, the more macroscopic one, like 20 years ago, time to market from a research uh, results to an instrument that finished on the market was considered to be about 15 years. Today, we speak about seven to 10 years during this uh, era of the pandemics. Uh, uh, the FDA and the European agencies uh, introduced some fast drugs in order to make some biomedical products uh, to reach the market, let's say, in time or very quickly. So from your point of view, from all these interesting uh, material-based uh, 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 research results. Uh, how much do you think that something that you find and would be applicable in the biomedical engineering area uh, would take to, to bring to the market? Thank you. Yeah, basically all these biological materials, they are composed by, let's say, uh, heavy molecules that can vibrate or move rather slowly and this is the reason that uh, these collective motions are falling into the terahertz range and this is very well known this is not only we that uh, who have studied their biological materials really there are many biomaterials that have these absorption lines in the terahertz range plus to that uh, what we have found maybe this was not uh, so well known in the bio or biophysical community that studying the materials in the terahertz and especially in the subterahertz range, one can very clearly see the contribution, spectral contribution of water, be that uh, confined water or bulk water or interfacial water. So having these uh, signatures that can be very nicely studied by terahertz and subterahertz spectroscopy, of course, can, one can apply corresponding models, can connect somehow those effects to the uh, biological or maybe medical uh, effects and then uh, again build models and study the effect one aims to understand something like that okay very well thank you very much for thank your, you uh, thank visual. you start from the very beginning i i repeat that uh, outline concerns a broad scope of uh, phenomena and applications of uh, dynamical uh, nuclear um, polarization in semiconductors and i came just to this first slide um 
the essence of this uh, tool for biomedicine is very nicely represented in this picture, which I took from the book, um, uh, from the paper by Diakonov and Perel. And um, uh, there are two systems in a uh, uh, solid. Electron spin system and nuclear spin system. And it is nuclei which are markers or tracers of different tissues or different uh, states of tissues in, in biomedicine. But they should be somehow excited, they should be somehow reached, they should be controlled. And the um, present tool is um, uh, based on the following uh, uh, physical picture. The optically oriented electrons, the electrons can be excited optically, they can uh, also radiate um, light. Uh, they um, um, produce uh, uh, an effective magnetic field. And um, this magnetic field um, uh, of polarized uh, nuclei occurs a feedback effect on the electronic spin system. So they are in a feedback loop. Therefore, they can influence the mutual polarization. And the hope was, and I will show how it was realized, to um, achieve an enhancement of the polarization of nuclei, um, which is usually rather weak in solids as distinct from electrons. So here are some uh, uh, introductory notions uh, which will be used uh, further. Um, electron spin in a constant magnetic field is characterized by this, uh, I would say Hamiltonian, um, this is a magnetic moment of the spin electron, and uh, uh, the coefficient is here electron G factor. Uh, this Hamiltonian has two eigenvalues, which correspond to spin up and spin down, and because of this sign minus for electrons, um, spin uh, down has lower energy, and spin up has high energy. The difference in spatial density of electrons with spin up and down is a measure of the electron spin magnetization, which is shown here. And it can be calculated in thermal equilibrium, both for classical statistics at high temperatures, it's related to temperature or at low temperatures, uh, it's related to the Fermi energy. So this is known. The metal sample is subjected furthermore to another field, the perpendicular alternating magnetic field. It can be in particular microwave radiation, it's another field, and the frequency uh, is um, selected in order to satisfy the electron uh, paramagnetic resonance, very well known in spectroscopy. This is a condition where um, the right-hand side is the distance between the eigenenergies of these spins with um, uh, directions uh, plus and minus. What happens in this case? In this case, um, two kinds of uh, processes take place. The relaxation drives the magnetization to its equilibrium value. This thermodynamic trend remains. But the alternating field induces more transitions uh, with some photo-induced relaxation time to, from the state with a higher population to the state with a lower population and leads to a decrease of magnetization. This is a simple um, equation which governs this um, uh, magnetization and in a stationary state, the both processes are counterbalanced, and we have the steady state magnetization. A strong alternating magnetic field, the resonance is saturated, the magnetization is zero, 
and um, in general case, we can introduce a saturation parameter, which will be important in, in what follows, which is related to the um, uh, magnetization, spin magnetization at the given uh, um, mag alternating magnetic field to that uh, with no alternating magnetic field. And this um, saturation parameter is remarkably is a function of the ratio of the spin relaxation time and uh, thermal relaxation time only. The amplitude of the microwave field uh, is inversely proportional to the uh, um, mean value of spin relaxation time and transverse relaxation time, and it can be controlled very well. Now, a few words about nuclear spin magnetization. Again, the same Hamiltonian um, with the magnetic moments of a nucleus already with a plus here gives two eigenvalues in case if our uh, nucleus uh, has spin one half. And in this case, already uh, lower level uh, is with spin nuclear spin up and higher level with uh, nuclear spin down. The difference in numbers of nuclei possessing spin up and down is a measure of the nuclear spin magnetization, which is needed for our um, goal. And um, uh, the thermal equilibrium value of this um, difference can be again calculated like it was done for electron spins. So we know the uh, thermal equilibrium magnetization of nuclei. But then the key uh, physical factor enters the play. There is an interaction between electronic spins and nuclear spins, and it is called uh, hyperfine dipole interaction. In fact, this is a very fundamental problem for solid state physics, but uh, in some approximations, this hyperfine dipole interaction is taken uh, just as a uh, scalar product of uh, these two uh, magnetic moments and uh, it's local in real time. Every nucleus is subjected next to the applied magnetic fields which we considered also to a magnetic field of polarized electron spins fluctuating due to the spin relaxation. And due to this effect, the nuclear spin relaxation um, um, acquires some uh, hyperfine interaction uh, driven uh, relaxation with uh, its typical time. But every electron is subjected to the total magnetic field of all nuclei. This I mentioned in the very first slide. And these two magnetic fields are comparable because electrons uh, 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 interact with a larger number of nuclei. They can feel more nuclei than only um, one or two. And this feedback leads to a steady state polarization, which is given by this formula, 11. And uh, in fact, um, um, it's uh, pertinent to the Overhauser effect. Nuclear spin polarization could be enhanced by the microwave radiation of the conducting electrons in certain metals. What do we need for that? We need the ratio of the geromagnetic ratios for electron here and for a nuclear spin. And if we take here for certainty the isotope silicon 29, this ratio is remarkably large. It's 3,000, it's more than 3,000. Therefore, um, there is a possibility to enhance the uh, magnetization of nuclei with respect to the thermodynamic limit uh, by a factor of um, uh, a few thousands. And um, this um, uh, was a motivation for the first observation of this silicon 29 nuclear spin polarization enhancement, which is um, 
uh, due to Lampel. I would like to go just to his results because they are remarkable. It's a classical work now, but it remains very uh, oeristically motivating. What is here? Here is the signal proportional to the derivative of the silicon nuclear magnetization. It's very pure silicon, highest purity, which was available at the time. Obtain in a DC magnetic field one Gauss. This is upper uh, curve. It's derivative of the EPR response or NPR response. The lower line, is a signal proportional to the derivative of the equilibrium, silicon nuclear magnetization. In a magnetic field, six kilogauss. Please compare these two numbers. This is one gauss and these are 6,000 gauss. And in the first case, due to this um, dynamical nuclear polarization, the signal is enhanced by more than three orders of magnitude. This comparison is um, given in the next slide, but um, the value um, which was measured, uh, it's really small as it's typical for nuclei, but it's uh, confidently measurable. And the enhancement of the nuclear polarization in this case uh, uh, was as high as, um, uh, uh, 2.8 uh, times 10 to the power 4. So um, I think this experimental work um, has remained uh, um, a motivator for all subsequent uh, uh, efforts, which were related also to pumping with secularly polarized light, uh, which gives already this enhancement due to the uh, um, optical pumping uh, rather than uh, prevalence over the saturation term. It can be also related to um, um, during illumination of uh, crystal silicon, uh, the uh, limiting polarization of this nuclei uh, occur to be dependent on the concentration of photo excited ex, um, excitons and um, electrons. Sorry, if there are uh, photo excited electrons, they produce additional um, enhancement of, of this um, effect of dynamical nuclear polarization. And um, um, as a next step, I would mention that um, experimentalists came to other materials, uh, direct band gap as distinct from silicon where this um, um, effect uh, is also very prominent and the materials which have been successfully applied for such an um, enhancement uh, were indium phosphide, cadmium sulfide, gallium arsenic, uh, aluminum and others. Now, we go to microparticles and nanoparticles. If we consider such a microparticles as those uh, uh, shown here, uh, they are made of uh, silicon uh, 29 in silicon uh, um, shell region uh, covered with silicon dioxide. Um, then there are two possibilities already in a microparticle that um, you have the central part I, um, uh, doped for example, with non-ionized boron or undoped so that the paramagnetic centers are only at the surface. And this um, so significantly changes the geometry of the um, uh, excitation of uh, um, uh, nuclei. Uh, um, in this case, uh, everything uh, occurs only uh, close to the surface, but in this case, uh, it's um, uh, everywhere in the microparticle and long distance spin diffusion to surface impurities uh, uh, leads to relatively slow relaxation and um, therefore direct coupling uh, of the uh, nuclei to the lattices weak. 
Uh, I have very short uh, time, but uh, I nevertheless um, would like to bring you uh, more, more recent uh, uh, achievements. And here it's um, uh, going to microparticles, for example, in microcrystalline silicon powders and um, a nuclei uh, in amorphous region become polarized by off-resonant microwave uh, radiation, while nuclei in the crystalline phase are polarized by spin diffusion, and therefore um, the uh, uh, typical times of, of this uh, polarizations uh, can be controlled simply by the uh, uh, ratio of uh, uh, the uh, areas with uh, um, uh, amorphous or with crystalline phase. Uh, here uh, is the dependence of the time of um, um, spin relaxation on the size of a microparticles or even nanoparticles. You see it's well below uh, uh, it can be uh, reached uh, one na nanometer or, or below nanometer. And um, it's interesting that um, when decreasing the size of the nanoparticle, the relaxation time can be changed by two orders of magnitude. And if uh, um, uh, some specific application needs uh, fast relaxation, it can be achieved by using small nanoparticles. The next are already um, uh, uh, other uh, approaches which relate, for example, cross-polarization, a transfer between uh, the uh, proton magnetization to the uh, silicon-29 nuclei. So protons can uh, play the role of electrons in the picture which I presented. But uh, protons are constituents of uh, large molecules, and uh, therefore one can trace the um, profile of, uh, of protons in, in uh, large molecules. Next point, um, there were um, successful applications for uh, in vivo uh, magnetic uh, resonance imaging of this hyperpolarized silicon nanoparticles. Um, and um, uh, this uh, is uh, um, an example of very different hyperpolarization times which can be achieved under various conditions and uh, for nanoparticles of different uh, radius. And finally, I still use a couple of minutes to show you that um, um, this... Um, sorry, uh, approach uh, was uh, applied in different uh, waves for uh, gastrointestinal, uh, intravascular, and tumor perfusion, perfusion imaging. The last two are, are related to uh, um, hyperpolarized silicon microparticles injected into the tumor, and then they made it visible the importance of uh, such uh, um, uh, application for therapy can be hardly overestimated. New discoveries about um, silicon nanoparticles as photosensitizers of singlet oxygen generation, which can be very useful for cancer therapy, will be presented tomorrow by uh, Professor Timoshenko here. And um, this is my last slide. Silicon nanocrystals have been used also sensitizers of um, hyperthermia as a therapy for cancer. Again, by um, introducing silicon nanoparticles, one can clearly see the effect of um, uh, high, hyperthermia. At this point, I would like to tell that um, the control of the nuclear spin polarization, um, which uh, was first shown by Lampel, has developed since then in a vast area. And I like to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for your presentation, Professor Fomin. And uh, I open the, 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 the paper for uh, any questions and for discussion. 
Any questions from the audience? No, let me see whether there is anything in the chat. No. Yes. Yeah. Uh, very well, then uh, I would just like to uh, uh, ask you whether these discoveries uh, have already been uh, uh, introduced into the clinical practice or is it currently only an experimental methodology? Yes, I think it's an experimental methodology which is being uh, performed uh, within the clinical uh, uh, environment. It's, uh, it's made in close collaboration with uh, real medicine and um, the samples which I have shown, they are provided from the um, clinics, but they are not yet included in uh, um, uh, 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 clinical uh, uh, praxis because it's, it's very new and it's ongoing. Thank you. So uh, I will be speaking now uh, about something that is happening in the micro world. And uh, in uh, this uh, uh, slide, you can see the content that I will be speaking about. So the first uh, issue that I will be mentioning is that one of the problems of the health care and medicine today is that uh, the fact that the uh, population is uh, aging very rapidly and uh, it's uh, the statistics that shows that the uh, population over 65 uh, will be more than 30 percent uh, as expected for the uh, end of the century. So uh, though we are very happy, all of us individually and as a community, that the uh, people are living much longer, but uh, it also causes the uh, <clears throat> uh, special, um, the special uh, uh, target to the healthcare system because the costs of the uh, caring of the elderly people is increasing. In this slide, you can see some of these expectations for the next uh, future. So uh, from the slide on my right hand side, uh, in the period of 2002 to the period of 2012, that means in approximately 10 years, the uh, average age of the population in uh, Europe for both men and women has increased nearly two years. And uh, the uh, annual uh, growth of the uh, per capita income in Europe is not so good as compared to the cost. So the green columns here are showing the growth of the healthcare costs in different uh, countries in the uh, European Union, while the red ones are showing the annual average growth of uh, the uh, uh, per capita, so sorry, the green are the costs and the, the red is the growth of the income per capita. And you can see actually that uh, in most cases for most of the countries in the European Union, the growth of the health costs is much higher than the growth of the per capita. Only Ireland uh, was uh, able to show the results different from this. So what is actually aging? We all understand very well the chronological aging, but uh, recently another term has been brought to the discussion about aging, and that is the so-called biological age, which actually enables uh, modeling of the perspectives of each person because uh, there are several models that have been introduced in order to uh, model the, this uh, future and shape it hopefully as well. And uh, the, uh, it, the parameters that are in the, included in these uh, models are the chronological age, some genetics, but a lot of lifestyle, nutrition, and uh, other conditions that uh, may be uh, actually uh, showing some of the perspectives for the person's future. Uh, how is it possible to keep the biological age of a person lower than the chronological one? The uh, practical results 
that we can use is that uh, exercising and physical activity are one of the parameters that are actively uh, contributing to keeping the biological age lower. And then there are also some other parameters. However, we must understand that this keeping of the biological age lower than the chronological, it's not a miracle. It's perhaps something that spends about five to 10 years in, in a person's uh, uh, life. So the other thing that we have to know is that uh, due to uh, aging of the population, actually people uh, uh, develop different kinds of chronic diseases. And therefore, it is very important to follow up their physical state. And uh, that may be, uh, of course, uh, achieved by monitoring of the vital signs of the human physiology. But it was also shown that uh, em emotional or physical condition of a person is uh, uh, very much influencing the uh, altogether uh, uh, state of uh, human health and well-being. And therefore, the number of these parameters that uh, might be good to be uh, followed up is uh, much larger. So what we are trying uh, to do, let's say, in medicine and in uh, healthcare today is to follow up the quality of life of the person, which then does not include only the uh, state of uh, healthiness or being uh, sick, but also the happiness of the persons. And that is, of course, different for each person individually. So uh, what are the technologies that may be uh, helping in uh, following the current status of a person's health and well-being? And uh, what uh, we would also like to get from this data is uh, something for the modeling of the perspectives of the uh, potential risks uh, for the future of a particular person so that uh, this health risk may be reached and uh, probably lowered by uh, uh, interventions, uh, medical and all the others. On the right hand side, uh, you can actually see a lot of uh, technologies that have been proposed for uh, the reaching of this purpose. Well, on the first place, there is wearable technology followed by smart, smart algorithms for analyzing all these data that are being uh, collected. And the newly, something that uh, is popular uh, in uh, introduction to the medical and healthcare problems is the so-called artificial intelligence. That means some of the algorithms that make decisions uh, without intervention of uh, the persons uh, from healthcare. So in order to make this possible, all the stakeholders must be uh, intro introduced into the solving of the problem. What we actually know without much uh, uh, research is that the system is expensive and it may be inefficient and unsuitable. Therefore, uh, this uh, uh, Preventional aspect of these actions have to be has to be introduced into education of the younger generations so that they take much higher responsibility in taking care of their health. The problem with the technology that uh, is currently used for monitoring of the physiological function of, of, of the population, and we are talking now primarily about the elderly population is that the dropout in the using is uh, relatively high. Let's say with the persons after the my myocardial infraction, they stop taking uh, care and uh, carrying any kind of the monitors uh, uh, regularly after approximately three months after the cardiac incident. So what uh, must be achieved with all this technology is the minimal disruption to the user, where we can say that the nanotechnologies that uh, were mentioned in uh, earlier uh, lectures today and, uh, and yesterday probably will make uh, 
possible due to the miniaturization and uh, due to lowering the power and consumption of such uh, uh, sensing uh, uh, units and uh, of the needs for any further uh, processing of the information that's getting uh, to the results of the uh, monitoring. Then it has to be proven in the utility. A large uh, number of the gadgets and medical devices that are being uh, today wearable is uh, rejected by the uh, population due to, let's say, a large number of false alarms. That means that the reliability of these devices has to be uh, increased. And then we come again to the eligible costs of use, which means that uh, the uh, question whether the healthcare system, the social one, is the carrier of the costs or the person, potential patient, uh, is that person who has to carry the costs. Uh, finally, the feasibility to integrate uh, such devices into the healthcare system is an important uh, uh, issue and uh, perhaps a little bit later we will touch this uh, issue again. So there is a number of bioelectrical, biomechanical uh, signals and quantities that uh, uh, can be and that already are being uh, tracked by different kinds of uh, uh, variable sensors. Uh, today uh, uh, the the uh, aim is also to include the biochemical quantities, uh, primarily very successful in uh, bl blood uh, sugar level monitoring, which became continuous these uh, days. So uh, from those technologies that I will touch today, because it's obvious that it doesn't fit into 30 minute lectures, are the sensors themselves and the sensors being uh, uh, enlarged to wearable wireless intelligent sensors with adding some of the electronics. Uh, then the integration of different kinds of sensors into wireless sensor networks, the way how to transmit this data to some kind of uh, storage and uh, processing uh, unit, which uh, very often has to be uh, somewhere out, not embedded into the uh, sensor uh, in itself, no matter how intelligent the sensor may be. And uh, there are also some other issues that may be mentioned if time enough. Uh, so which uh, the issues in which uh, my department and my co-workers are included is uh, the policies on health aging. Recently, we had a uh, large conference in Zagreb, which was a uh, uh, it was uh, focused on the future of healthy aging and also some uh, policy documents were produced that uh, will be introduced uh, into the policy of the European Union. Uh, the second uh, line that we are having in our research is the research of variable wireless intelligence sensors. So there are some of the later latest publications uh, in this field mentioned on this slide. We also organize these intelligent sensors into wireless sensor networks. And finally, uh, we were studying the patient monitoring from the point uh, of uh, the most effective way to transmit the data or the signals uh, that means in the field of the telemetry. On this slide, you can see some of the sensors that we have been uh, developing. On the left-hand side is an older version, and uh, on the right-hand side is a more uh, recent one. As you can see here, we are uh, reducing the size of the devices, and uh, by the same time, we are also making such changes that we can reduce the power consumption. So from the point of view of the uh, intention of such sensors, it is that uh, we uh, uh, monitor physical activity of the patients and also that we uh, try to uh, convince them to use the same devices for monitoring of their efforts in exercising. 
And uh, what we are trying to do is to uh, monitor the exercising quantitatively and qualitatively. So the quantitative is relatively easy. That's the number of movements that the patient has been uh, do doing during a, uh, uh, an exercise uh, uh, series. And the qualitative one is monitoring whether the person is doing the exercise in a correct way. So that prevention of any kind of, uh, let's say, uh, events that we do not want to happen, like some injuries or something like that, are preventing by the analysis of these uh, patterns of the movements. So uh, if you have a look at this slide here, and we'll see now what happens. Ah, yes. I will open all the, all the uh, parts of the slide. So from relatively noisy signals that you, let's say, get from the accelerometer by using of some calculations and extracting some of the features, uh, putting it into the vector field machine, and then finally, you can get some kind of uh, uh, recognition of a particular movement. And uh, if you look at the results, well, um, if you want to make a very, very high resolution in differentiating of different uh, 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 daily activities, then the accuracy is not very high. Now, the real question is why would we nearly need to differentiate sitting up uh, uh, or, or stand, sorry, sitting down or standing up from lying down and uh, uh, standing up from a lying position. So uh, what we recommend is a much uh, uh, rougher classification, which uh, differentiates than the uh, high energy and low energy classes of uh, daily activities. So that in such a case, uh, accuracy can be reached that is more than 90%. So for a general knowledge of uh, uh, the uh, level of the activity uh, of a particular person uh, that may be considered uh, as good enough. But what we also want to get by uh, uh, asking the patients uh, to wear this sensor is to detect uh, some unwanted uh, hazardous events like falling down of these patients. So uh, here we do want to get a very high accuracy of the parameters uh, so that we can uh, have such a protocol where the false, that the uh, uh, false detection of false is minimized and the uh, false alarms are also minimized. So we have done uh, uh, some uh, acquisition of uh, uh, different uh, uh, daily activities and uh, different simulated falls in a number of uh, persons. And uh, we used several kinds of uh, feature extraction protocols so that uh, we finally came to a protocol which we uh, which we recommended in our latest uh, paper uh, on how to actually track and how to extract the, the false signals uh, out of the uh, uh, activities of daily living. So the procedure consists of detecting three parts of the uh, of the poles, and then uh, uh, by different features of uh, these uh, parts of the signal, it is possible to detect the poles with uh, uh, high accuracy. And then, as we said, we want to integrate uh, more, more uh, uh, measurements and uh, information uh, uh, acquisitions into these uh, sensors. In our latest uh, model, of course, uh, in addition to this uh, um, integrated measurement units for uh, accelerometry for orientation, that means the gyroscope and magnetometer, we added also the possibility to uh, follow the heart rate and the ECG. Uh, this is, of course, not the only device that is uh, doing the same uh, uh, issues, and uh, the 
real problem then happens that uh, you need to pick up this data, some, something or, or, or a person has to analyze it in order to get some of the results. So uh, the number of the, the different uh, sensors in the market is very, very large, uh, but still uh, du during these COVID pandemics, uh, the WHO uh, was able to prove that uh, carrying these gadgets and also instructing the, the, the information from them may be very useful in combating COVID-19 in terms of uh, getting some of the information uh, that uh, uh, are good predictors of, uh, good early predictors of uh, uh, COVID-19. And uh, Professor Krishnan and myself have been writing about that recently for UNESCO. It would be nice to have a uh, better and more detailed uh, information on the ECG itself. But the problem with all these uh, wearable textile uh, uh, units is that they are very, very much prone to different kinds of artifacts, which then uh, make uh, in some uh, time, in some periods of time during the daily activities, impossible to accurately detect the ECG itself. So as I said, we also integrated uh, several uh, sensors into a uh, network. The main, uh, let's say, uh, feature of the network is that there is a sensor that is uh, picking up different kinds of uh, physiological features. And then uh, there is some kind of a central processing unit that is uh, being organized in such a way that uh, in, in the case of uh, uh, normal uh, physiological state of the person, the, the, the data is not transferred into some kind of a cloud or something like that, only if there is an alarm or warning uh, 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 result of the processing present, then the information is carried to the other uh, system parts. And uh, what this system that is being carried enables is entering some patient data that then in the combination with the information that is being accessed from the different sensors enables personalized health decisions at this lower level of data acquisition and processing. So different kinds of combinations of uh, sensors we were using can be seen in the left uh, hand side of the page. Five um, minutes, please. Yes, thank you. I'm aware of that. I'm on, on slide 31 now, and there are about 40. So the question that we have to ask ourselves when we are designing such kind of systems is uh, what uh, information we need and how much of this information is really needed. Because if you put 10 sensors to a person, the endurance of such uh, monitoring will be very, very short time. Anyway, the next issue is the telemetry. So even implant, implanted devices today have telemetry, but uh, up to very recently, uh, the uh, data was transferred to some kind of a base station and then needed uh, uh, further uh, information chain in order to transfer it to some uh, decision-making uh, place. And uh, the ICT today has uh, many different kinds of uh, technologies that are uh, enabling to transfer different kinds uh, of data through the uh, internet and the different kinds of networks to such a, a self-management system, which is then supported by the experts from outside, like this one from Taiwan. The problem today is that in addition to the different gadgets and uh, uh, medical devices that are bearable and that the patients are carrying, we can get it also uh, information from some wearable uh, medical devices uh, like the uh, insulin pumps that people are carrying. 
Finally, we have the implanted devices that also today may be connected to the uh, to the network, and uh, also some stationary medical devices like blood pressure measurements, me measurement devices that also uh, sometimes uh, are connected to the network and send the information. So all this has to be integrated into a network uh, and then processed, and finally. In that case, we can hope to get some accurate results for predictions of the diseases. Anyway, in the field of the Internet of Things, uh, about 47% of this pie uh, is today uh, expected to be dealing with healthcare devices. As I said, the pacemakers were in uh, previous times connected to the network through some specialized devices. Uh, which needed then uh, presence of uh, a person or a uh, system that uh, was uh, processing this data. Uh, some of that was also entered into the electronic health record of the patient. Today's implantable devices, primarily the pacemakers, have the low energy Bluetooth uh, connectivity that enables uh, transmission of the data through patients' uh, smartphones into the uh, network that is then uh, sending some feedback to the patient himself. Some of the data is also available to the patient uh, through an application that uh, he or she can uh, start at the moment from phone. So uh, what you can see actually is that uh, there is a large diversity of possibilities uh, of picking up the information, organizing it and uh, making decisions that are in favor of patients and of the elderly. However, I see as the main problem currently, no matter how much we speak about artificial intelligence, uh, which would be uh, probably the most suitable tool for the analysis is the trustfulness of the uh, data that is being uh, entered. The problem here is that uh, um, we have uh, like 7 billion people who are individuals and who in each moment act differently. So it's a uh, very little that uh, can be permanently uh, uh, identified as a pattern of health and of the everyday living of a person, uh, all the time some changes have to be taken into, into calculation and we will need some time more to organize this system so that it really becomes prevention and that it really uh, is able to detect uh, adverse effects in real time, that means on time for a particular person. Thank you very much for your attention and uh, I will be happy to answer any question in case there is some more interest. Thank you. Professor Magyarevich, thank you very much for your excellent presentation. Thank you. Which in fact uh, provided us a kind of overview of the activities of the International Federation for Medical and Biological Engineering. And I would like to profit by this occasion to extend to you our congratulations on the occasion Again. of election as a president-elect of this International Federation for Again. Medical and Biological Engineering. And to Again. wish you a lot of creative successes in your mission to encourage, support, represent, and promote the worldwide medical and biological engineering community. Thank you very much. Uh, I would just like to say that uh, uh, I'm happy that the IFMB is endorsing the conferences in Moldova for at least three generations. And uh, also uh, I see that the biomedical engineering uh, uh, community in Moldova is very active. So I would like just to say that uh, currently nominations for different positions in the, uh, in the governing bodies is open. And also in a few days, we will open the call for awards of the IFMBE. 
all those to be presented uh, at the World Congress next year in June in Singapore. So I think sincerely hope that the conditions uh, due to the pandemic will allow also face-to-face -face meetings. And I hope that uh, many of you who I was listening to will also come to present your papers at the World Congress. Thank so. you very much for this information. And once again, much success to you as a president-elect. Now the open, the open... Uh, the, the talk is open for discussion and allow me to put uh, this question. Uh, sure. We all know the famous book by Robert Freitas, Nanomedicine, yes. which was published, if I am right, in 1999, just at the edge of the millennium. Yes. And there was a kind of futuristic uh, description of um, how this um, health uh, caring system should be organized um, in, the, in the future of mankind. Mm -hmm. And there was um, a really very appealing picture that the body of, of every human uh, must be filled with a lot of sensors which will monitor every every deviation from from a normal state and then the information from the centers will be gathered somewhere in the central processing unit and this central processing unit will communicate to one um, uh, i would say governing system um, in the corresponding locality in order to immediately undertake actions if there are some first symptoms of, of something what should be treated immediately and certainly at nanoscale. I see now that um, uh, your developments um, uh, represent in a sense a step in that direction because this monitoring and, and analysis in real time of the data about physiological status of a human. It's really what is needed for early diagnostics and therefore for good health um, uh, conditions. My question, do you think that this futuristic picture by Freitas um, uh, would be really a practical goal for mankind or it is more, um, more a description of direction um, where um, uh, we all should go, um, but uh, uh, not uh, uh, aiming and putting billions of sensors in every human's body. I am very much interested to hear your opinion on that. Yeah. Thank you very much for the question. Well, uh, at this stage of the development of healthcare systems, I may say that we are going in this uh, idealistic uh, direction to be able to gather as much information from a person as possible. Uh, well, uh, if you compare a uh, variable sensor to the other kind, that means to, uh, non, uh, uh, to, to the sensors that are not in direct contact with the person, of course, that is also a possible uh, uh, direction to go but it's much more expensive because then you have to fill in with different sense of the whole uh, environment of the person. And practically, that is not uh, easy to achieve uh, for a person who is leaving his home or his room. But uh, uh, the direction is certainly in, 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 in uh, this sense, which means that with the introduction of electronic health records, we get, get the possibility to uh, gain all the information on one place. And then you can attach to that some uh, expert system, which today are called an artificial intelligence to solve some of the problems. You know, the question of whether you can do and whether you can intervene in real time, it's always uh, in a way questionable. But if you take uh, implantable defibrillator cardioverters as an example, and the first uh, uh, units were implanted into human body uh, some 50 years ago in eight, 85 or 86, 
we can show that this is a completely autonomous system that is implanted into the body and based on the analysis of only intracardial uh, ECG, it decides whether to shock the heart or not. And each implemented so shock is actually saving of uh, a human life. And one device of such a kind may uh, uh, implement uh, up to 70, 75 shocks. That means that mm -hmm. it can save 75 times somebody's life. And mm -hmm. can anybody imagine that if somebody needed this shock 75 times, that every time there would be somebody who would run to the first defibrillator, which may be automatic, somebody in the shopping center, university, or, or, or mm -hmm. cinema, bring it within five minutes to the person and apply the shocks? I think not. So a part of this future is already reached, but uh, in a very early prediction of so many diseases, that are present, it still is a relatively far away future. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much for your comprehensive answer. And again, I think that your activities in the International Federation will approach us to that future. I, sin I sincerely hope so. <laughs>